China's navy is catching up to the US, but while China's naval capability has come a long way from the third Taiwan crisis, its apparent strength is not all it seems. Here's why. Here are two of the most powerful countries in the world. Both China, the fourth largest country in terms of area spanning approximately 3.7 million square miles, and the United States, which is the third largest country by land area covering about 3.8 million square miles, are major economic powers with substantial global significance. China has the world's second largest economy with a GDP of approximately $18.1 trillion in 2022. The United States, however, has the largest economy globally, with a GDP of about $25.46 trillion in 2022. Okay, so the US has got China whipped when it comes to land area size and economic success, but what about military power? Well, here's where it gets scary. China aims to position itself as a significant global military power and has set its sights on achieving global dominance by 2049. Right now, China's Air Force ranks second globally, just behind the United States, which possesses the most formidable Air Force strength. According to reports, the United States operates approximately 10,000 more air platforms compared to China. In terms of total aircraft strength, China is listed as having 3,260 aircraft in service, while the United States boasts an impressive fleet of 13,233 aircraft. This substantial difference emphasizes the United States' superior air power and its larger operational aircraft count. But what about sea power? One of the markers of a superpower is the ability to project maritime power over long distances. States which have been able to do so have enormous influence in regional or world affairs and can exert huge leverage over their less capable rivals. It is therefore not surprising that as China's wealth has grown, it has invested heavily in its ambitions to create a blue water navy that it hopes will one day challenge the US Navy for supremacy, at least within the waters of its immediate neighborhood. But how close is China to that goal? What is the state of US-China strategic competition at sea and how is the United States planning to maintain its lead on the world's waterways? What technologies and weapons is the US Navy developing to adapt to the growing power of China's People's Liberation Army Navy PLAN. You may have heard reports that China now has the world's largest navy. There are 355 ships in its fleet as of December 30th, 2021. The Chinese brass is keen to expand that number. It plans to increase its fleet size to 420 ships by 2025 and 460 ships by 2030. These figures do not cover the additional 85 patrol combatant ships and other small ships capable of bearing anti-ship cruise missiles. China's countless fishing boats have also acted as a de facto maritime militia, harassing vessels from other countries in international waters. China's navy has the numbers, but here's the bad news. It is increasing in the quality of its ships as well. China was seen putting its new naval muscle to use in the summer of 2022, following a visit by then House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to Taiwan. For several days after Pelosi left, Chinese ships and aircraft demonstrated their military potential in the waters off Taiwan. This show of force would have been inconceivable 25 years earlier, in the third Taiwan Strait Crisis of 1995-96. At the time, when Taiwan was set to hold its first direct presidential election and became a fully-fledged democracy, the mainland launched several missiles across the Taiwan Strait, prompting the United States to send two carrier battle groups to the area. China had no choice but to back down in the face of such pressure, but the Chinese leadership never forgot the incident. To them, it recalled the century of humiliation, a time in the 19th and early 20th centuries when China repeatedly found itself at the mercy of foreign powers. Since the Chinese leadership considers Taiwan a rogue province, continued American and allied military support for the island reminds them of those times. After the crisis, China resolved to never let such a scenario happen again and took steps to increase its naval power. This was a deviation from the norm. With only a few brief exceptions, China has never historically been a sea power. It has traditionally focused its military resources on maintaining a large army capable of defending its vast land borders. Up until recently, this was the objective of the Chinese brass. However, with China's continued problems with Taiwan and its containment within the natural barrier of the first island chain, a string of islands off China's waters which stretch from Japan to Indonesia, the Chinese leadership decided that only by becoming a sea power would China take its rightful place as a true global superpower. With its growing economic might, especially since it joined the World Trade Organization in 2001, China finally had the chance to make a play for naval prominence. 
Included in China's new naval assets are three aircraft carriers. China's naval brass plans to increase that number and bring its carrier force up to five by 2030, with more to come after that. The PLAN also aims to increase its submarine force by building 10 ballistic missile submarines by the same year. While China's naval capability has come a long way from the third Taiwan crisis, its apparent strength is not all it seems. China may have more vessels in its fleets than any other country, but that is because most of the ships are still small. Aside from the number of ships, one way to measure a state's naval power is through the combined tonnage of its fleets. Tonnage is the measurement of a ship's weight. The PLAN's total combined tonnage as of 2020 is between 1.8 and 2 million tons. The US Navy, though, stands at 4.6 million tons. The reason why tonnage matters is because small, low-quality vessels do comparatively little in actual naval confrontation. The United States could build many more smaller boats if it wanted to, but instead focuses on sturdier vessels with advanced offensive and defensive weaponry and robust transit options for Marines to stage amphibious assaults. While many American policymakers have called for the United States to build more ships and restore the Navy to Cold War-level fleet sizes, no one in Washington is calling for an imitation of China's fleet composition. Small patrol boats and other irregular craft do the US Navy no good in its global mission to maintain secure and free navigation on the world's oceans. China has closed the tonnage gap since the time of the Third Taiwan Strait Crisis, when the United States had a total tonnage lead of over 4 million, but it still lags significantly behind. China's Navy has other problems. Two of its much-publicized aircraft carriers are older models that use a stowbar, short takeoff but arrested recovery system to launch its planes. China's third aircraft carrier, the Fujian, uses a more modern catapult system comparable to those used by the US Navy's carriers, which allows it to launch its onboard planes faster. The Fujian is therefore a significant step in China's technological capability. However, how would China be able to launch its planes without pilots to fly them? China has a serious shortage of trained naval aviators, and the Fujian and its successors will add to the stress, both in the number of pilots these new carriers will demand and in teaching them how to use the catapult system. Overall, the PLAN is many decades behind the US Navy's institutional knowledge and experience. Case in point, it lacks a fighter made specifically for training carrier pilots. The current aircraft of choice is the JL-9G, a single-engine, twin-seat plane that is incapable of simulating emergency landings on a carrier's flight deck because it is too light and slow. So far, the PLAN's attempts to create an adequate training aircraft have fallen short of satisfactory. Establishing programs for cadet naval aviators has also proven difficult for the PLAN. This lack of institutional knowledge and experience makes sense, given China's history and its only recent move towards sea power. Unfortunately for the Chinese leadership, institutional knowledge doesn't come as easily as new ships do. China might have made progress at a rapid pace, but in a confrontation between carrier groups as they currently stand, the United States would still have an overwhelming advantage, for a few reasons. First, the United States has many more advanced fourth-generation and fifth-generation fighters to call upon. America's arsenal includes not only carrier-based planes, but land-based F-22s that would fly from Japan to lend a hand in a real battle. China's most advanced fighter, on the other hand, the J-20, cannot be launched from a carrier, and it's unclear if it can rival America's F-22 and F-35 in air-to-air -air combat. Meanwhile, upgraded Tomahawk cruise missiles and submarines would also pose significant threats to the burgeoning Chinese carrier force. Although we do not have good knowledge of the extent of China's electronic warfare capabilities, which could potentially counter such ship and submarine-fired missiles if they are advanced enough. Another area that the PLAN significantly lags behind the US Navy in is submarines, which was one of the reasons why Beijing made such a big protest about the AUKUS submarine sharing agreement. China currently has a fleet of 56 submarines. Six of them are ballistic missile submarines with payloads capable of reaching the United States homeland. Another six are nuclear-powered attack submarines. The bulk of the fleet, 44, are diesel-electric attack submarines. This is where China's navy is at its most pronounced disadvantage, and lags the furthest behind. Experts believe that China's current main submarine, the Shang class, is only on par with 1970s Soviet-era designs, and China has not invested as much in anti-submarine warfare as in other parts of its naval buildup. It has tried to close the gap recently, equipping its newer surface ships with more sophisticated sonars, 
China has also introduced its new U-8 missile launch torpedo and KQ-200 maritime patrol aircraft. Even so, these are comparative baby steps in actually defeating the formidable American submarine force. China may also be able to deploy more submarines in its immediate waters, but it is still at a severe disadvantage in submarine-to-submarine -submarine warfare. A comparison of the engineering of the two navies' underwater vessels will paint a clearer picture of why the US Navy still has a decisive advantage in undersea warfare. The United States uses nuclear-powered submarines, which are faster, capable of diving deeper, and have a longer range than the submarines China uses. China's diesel-electric-based submarines have one advantage. When running on electric power, they are quieter than nuclear submarines. However, these vessels cannot run on electric power for long. They have to either surface or pop up a snorkel to recharge their electric batteries and run on diesel power for the duration of that operation. At that point, they are significantly noisier than nuclear subs and far more vulnerable to attack. Meanwhile, nuclear submarines can stay quiet and deep for months on end. Although the range and duration of operations would not necessarily be as important for the Chinese in a confrontation with the US Navy because hostile encounters would take place near Chinese waters, the depth, stealth ability, and operating times of the American and Allied nuclear submarines would help to defeat China's strategy of overwhelming enemy naval forces with a reign of anti-access area-denial ballistic missiles. These projectiles currently pose a severe threat to American carrier groups and surface ships operating too close to China's waters. Submarines, on the other hand, are much harder to detect, and the US Navy's advantage in underwater operations allows the United States to threaten the Chinese mainland. As with aircraft carriers, China intends to build new next-generation submarines. By 2030, it could have between 30 and 40 nuclear-powered submarines. Whether it will have the institutional know-how to recruit and train competent submariners may be a more difficult matter to determine. China's current underwater deficiencies notwithstanding, it is still eager to flex its submarine muscle and has begun keeping at least one of its nuclear-armed ballistic missile submarines at sea at all times, with near-continuous patrols into the hotly contested waters of the South China Sea, making things more difficult for the United States and its allies and the waters of the region more dangerous. It is a sign of what the PLAN seeks for the future. As things stand now, though, China tacitly acknowledges its disadvantages in maritime warfare and relies mostly on a defensive strategy to mitigate the threat that the US Navy poses. At the heart of its strategy are various classes of land-based short- and medium-range ballistic missiles. These missiles, based in mainland China and on its illegally built artificial islands in the South China Sea, pose a serious threat to American surface ships operating in the waters of the first island chain. Most formidable is its vast stockpile of short-range missiles, effective at distances up to 1,000 kilometers. The US Department of Defense estimates that China has between 750 and 1,500 of these, and they pose a menacing threat to Taiwan and every American base in Japan and South Korea too. China also has between 150 and 450 medium-range and 80 to 160 intermediate-range ballistic missiles respectively. These missiles can reach American ships and assets much further away from China's mainland. Some of them are capable of hitting Guam, the largest base in the region. China is currently building more ballistic missiles in an attempt to exert leverage over progressively more distant areas of the Indo-Pacific region. Additionally, although the PLAN is not currently capable of defeating the US Navy in a head-to-head -head confrontation, China would have the advantage of operating near its territory in any real conflict. No one on either side expects a midway-style battle on the high ocean. This reality means that the American supply lines would be much longer and more vulnerable to Chinese ballistic missile attacks, the tyranny of distance. China would also be able to concentrate all of its naval assets in a confrontation with the United States, where in contrast, the latter has global commitments. Policymakers and war planners in Washington have long sought to concentrate resources in the Indo-Pacific region to counter China's expansionism but bureaucratic and international resistance have often thwarted those plans, with Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine putting even more pressure on the United States to maintain military forces in Europe at high levels. Between these commitments, China's sheer number of assets, the tricky supply situation, and China's continued buildup in quality and quantity, the US Navy cannot rely on maintaining its traditional superiority forever, and the stakes are getting higher. Many experts warn that slowly but surely, the United States is losing its traditional military advantage in the Indo-Pacific region. 
and the cost of victory in any potential confrontation with China has become much higher than even a decade ago. So what is the United States doing to keep its edge at sea in a time of growing competition? No American naval strategy in the Indo-Pacific region would come independent of the consideration of its allies, especially Japan. So what would be their contributions to the naval balance of power in the Indo-Pacific? Japan recently announced that it would spend 2% of its GDP on defense by 2027, lifting traditional post-World War II restrictions to build a military capable of offensive operations. A new aircraft carrier, the country's first since World War II, is included in those plans. Even so, decades of minimal defense spending and the loss of institutional know-how will not be overcome so easily. Some American policymakers and national security experts fear that the benefit of Japan's renewed commitment to its military will only show up well after 2027, when China's capabilities will be even higher than they are today. Other American allies in the region like Taiwan and the Philippines are not nearly as capable. South Korea has a strong army but is not in a position to play a robust role in a sea confrontation with the growing strength of the PLAN. This reality means that the increasingly precarious situation will remain intact for the time being, with the overwhelming share of the Indo-Pacific's defense burden falling on the United States. One of the items on the US Navy's intermediate horizon is to arm its Zumwalt-class destroyers with hypersonic missiles by 2025. Tests of some ship-fired devices are currently scheduled for later that year. This weapon, called the Intermediate Range Conventional Prompt Strike, is a non-nuclear missile with a glide vehicle exceeding Mach 5 and a range of over 1,700 kilometers. The US Navy is also experimenting with ship-fire laser weapons that could act as a much better line of defense against China's big arsenal of ballistic missiles. The Navy received its first Helios, high-energy laser with integrated optical dazzler and surveillance system in the third quarter of fiscal year 2022 and has requested $35 million worth of them in its 2023 budget. The Helios system is ideal for countering anti-ship missiles and can do so cheaply, because lasers do not require stockpiles of ammunition which can be expensive to manufacture and transport. Helios instead uses power from the ship itself and does not require a separate energy magazine, making each shot extremely cheap. The US Navy hopes that such cheap laser shots will one day efficiently nullify the much more expensive missiles they will be targeting. Helios is currently designed for integration on Burke and Arleigh class ships, but the Navy is planning to adapt it elsewhere. Unlike with hypersonic missiles, the United States currently leads China in laser technology, but China is proceeding apace with its own plans. As drones and missiles get more sophisticated, laser countermeasures will only be more important in the future. The Navy had been experimenting with railguns, electromagnetic projectile weapons, for more than a decade, but suspended the program in 2021 in favor of hypersonic missiles. Suspension does not mean permanent consignment, however, and the Navy might pick the program back up. Like lasers, railguns have the advantage of not needing to carry as big of an ammunition magazine, since their projectiles are not launched with gunpowder or fuel, but electromagnetic power that can be generated from the host ship. Drones are also set to play a big part in the future of naval operations, including drone ships and submarines, such as the experimental Orca which will have a range of 6,500 nautical miles and be able to run alone for several months. The Navy plans for Orcas to be capable of anti-submarine warfare, with MK-46 or MK-48 heavy torpedoes. They are even being designed to carry anti-ship missiles. Unmanned ships and submarines would at the very least be expendable targets for China to send its heavy stockpile of ballistic missiles at, reducing the high American casualties that they would otherwise cause and permit the United States to grow bolder as the Chinese deplete their stockpiles. As we have seen in the war in Ukraine, ammunition gets depleted quickly in a modern conflict. Ammunition which is often expensive to make, with its precision instruments and advanced electronics. Any cheap drone which can exhaust China's advanced munitions would be worth its weight in gold for the American naval brass. China is also keen on developing unmanned submersibles, signaling that this will be a burgeoning area of competition between the two rivals in the Indo-Pacific region. Drone carriers, unmanned ships, and unmanned submersibles are not the only aspects of science fiction that are quickly becoming a reality, however. Jetpacks are one of the more unusual ways that the US Navy is planning to maintain its maritime edge. Since their inceptions, the Navy and Marine Corps have been designed to work together. Supporting amphibious operations is one of the Navy's most important missions. One of the ways the Navy is planning to continue with this tradition is by experimenting with jetpacks. 
The jet suits the US Navy and its ally the Royal Navy is experimenting with can reach speeds of 85 miles per hour and altitudes of 12,000 feet. The US Navy was evidently inspired by the Iron Man movies. The Iron Man suits are powered by five gas turbine jet engines and weigh about 75 pounds when they have full tanks. Jet fuel, diesel, or even kerosene are all acceptable fuels. A test of a similar jet suit by the Royal Marines showed that these devices can be operated with a high degree of precision, enabling a wearer to take off from a speedboat and land on the deck of a much larger vessel. Although these prototype Iron Man suits are noisy, there will be less of a need for stealth in any real-world situation that they'd be used in. If naval combat gets to the point where one side is trying to board the enemy's ships, stealth is long gone. The Iron Man suits could also support amphibious operations, with US naval vessels launching marines at targeted areas. Imagine hundreds of them storming towards a shore. They would be much harder to target than helicopters or landing craft. Already, paramedics in Great Britain have used the jet suit to reach difficult places, and firefighters are also interested in the suit's ability to help them access hard areas rapidly. Though the world isn't quite ready for it yet, we probably aren't too far away from a world where swarms of marines decked out in Iron Man suits will take to the skies at low altitude. Because a naval confrontation between the US Navy and the PLAN would occur in the comparatively confined waters of the first island chain and not on the high seas, the Iron Man suit could prove an effective method of projecting force. The US Navy remains the world's premier maritime fighting force, but as China's wealth and power continues to grow, and as the PLAN continues to modernize, the United States must continue to look for ways to push the envelope with innovations that we might find hard to believe now. China wants to break out of the first island chain and have more of a voice in the waters of the world. The United States wants to contain China within the waters close to its territory. Whoever holds the edge in the technology race will come closest to achieving their respective goal. But what do you think? In a battle between the US and Chinese Navy, who would win? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. China has had its eyes set on Taiwan since the 17th century, and recently its grabby, power-hungry hands have been reaching towards this semiconductor-rich and technologically important little island more aggressively than usual. If only it wasn't for that pesky Taiwan Relations Act which requires the US to provide Taiwan with protection against anything that could jeopardize the security or the social or economic system of the people on Taiwan. Xi Jinping would probably already be all over Taiwan and its processing chips. Even so, China is not about to let go of the idea of fully taking over one of the world's most important economic focal points anytime soon. Exactly how worried should Taiwan be about China's potential invasion? When Russia invaded Ukraine in early 2022, it set off the largest conflict in Europe since World War II. Understandably, the surprise invasion sent shockwaves around the world causing many countries to re-evaluate their security. Nowhere was this more true than the island nation of Taiwan, another state with a large, threatening neighbor laying historical claim to its territory. Russia's invasion sparked fears of similar actions against Taiwan by China, a scenario which could destabilize not only East Asia, but potentially the entire world. How did Taiwan come to be such an important global economic center? One word, civil war. Here's what we mean. As with Russia and Ukraine, the shared history of Taiwan and China goes back hundreds of years. Throughout the 16th century, the Chinese gradually gained influence and control over the island, then known as Formosa through intermarriage and trade. By the late 17th century, the Qing Dynasty officially incorporated Taiwan into its empire, by which point the island was mostly ethnically Han Chinese. In 1895, following its victory in the First Sino-Japanese War, Japan took control of Taiwan from China. The Japanese implemented economic and social reforms on the island, which led to limited modernization and industrialization. However, the occupation also resulted in widespread discrimination against Taiwanese people, who were viewed as inferior to the Japanese. With its loss at the end of World War II, Japan was forced to relinquish control of Taiwan, and the island was returned to Chinese rule. However, almost immediately, Taiwan became embroiled in the Chinese Civil War, which was raging at the time between the nationalists, led by Chiang Kai-shek, and the communists, led by Mao Zedong. In mainland China, the communists were victorious, and in 1949 established the People's Republic of China, or PRC. The defeated nationalists were forced to flee to Taiwan, where they established the Republic of China, or ROC. 
With both governments still claiming to be the legitimate government of China, no peace agreement was ever signed, and the civil war technically continues to this day. Under the nationalist government, Taiwan experienced significant economic growth and modernization. However, it was also a period of severe authoritarian rule, with limited political freedom and human rights abuses. In the 1980s, there was a growing movement for democracy and Taiwanese identity, which led to protests and eventually a transition to democratic rule of the island in the 1990s. Today, Taiwan remains a prosperous democracy, with a vibrant civil society, legal protections, and a strong sense of Taiwanese identity. On the mainland, the PRC also went through some spectacular transformations. Most of Mao's rule was extremely turbulent, with industrialization, but also the mass famine of the Great Leap Forward and political chaos and repression of the Cultural Revolution. Following Mao's death, the PRC's new leader, Deng Xiaoping, began a series of economic reforms in 1978. Fueled by the market-based policies, massive investment in infrastructure, and cheap labor, these reforms would give China decades GDP growth exceeding 10% per year, lifting hundreds of millions from poverty and leaving the country as the world's second largest economy today. Yet throughout this period of transformation, the issue of Taiwan never went away, with both sides continuing to claim legitimate rulership of China. Under the PRC's One China principle, no country with whom it held diplomatic relations could recognize the ROC. For much of the Cold War, most governments continued to recognize the ROC, keeping the Chinese Communist Party relatively isolated. This changed by 1979, when the US switched its official recognition to the PRC, naming it as the sole legal government of China. But while it officially recognized Taiwan as part of China, the US also continued unofficial relations with Taiwan. Among other things, this has entailed providing the island with billions in advanced military assistance to defend itself from a potential invasion and regularly sending the navy through the Taiwan Strait. Today, Taiwan's status remains a highly contentious issue in China's relations with the US and others. China continues to view Taiwan as a renegade province that must be reunited with the mainland, while Taiwan sees itself as a separate and sovereign entity. Xi Jinping, the current leader of China has reinforced this position, calling the reunification of Taiwan a historic mission and unshakable commitment for his government. Now, where have we heard that line before? Ah yes, Putin has been feeding it to the people of Russia as part of his war propaganda since February 2022. With the invasion of Ukraine and deteriorating relations between the US and China, many have begun to speculate about Taiwan. Will the island meet a similar fate? If so, would China fare better than Russia has? And if the US chooses to protect Taiwan, could such an invasion spiral into open conflict between superpowers? These questions are made more important by both Taiwan's role as the world's largest semiconductor manufacturer, a critical link in the modern global economy, and by America's purposefully ambiguous policy towards the issue. Their answers are also complex since any invasion of Taiwan would look very different from Ukraine and could be far more costly for both sides reflecting the island's unique circumstances and singular importance to our modern world. In terms of sheer numbers, it is clear that China would have the advantage against Taiwan in almost every way. China has the world's largest population at 1.4 billion, compared to only 23.5 million in Taiwan. And China is an economic superpower, worth $18.3 trillion GDP to Taiwan's 1.27 trillion. Similarly, China's armed forces, the People's Liberation Army, or PLA, has over 2 million active forces to Taiwan's 169,000, as well as vastly more tanks, aircrafts, submarines, naval ships, and artillery. Its enormous military budget of $225 billion also dwarfs Taiwan's, leaving little doubt which is the stronger power in absolute terms. Yet, as the war in Ukraine has shown, numbers alone don't count for everything, and despite the odds against it, Taiwan's military and economy is still in a far better position than Ukraine's was prior to the Russian invasion. In 2021, the Taiwanese defense budget was over $15 billion, nearly three times that of Ukraine for the same year, while its overall GDP was nearly five times larger. But that's not all. Taiwan also has a modern military with advanced technology and well-trained soldiers. The US has been supplying the island with powerful weapons for decades, including F-16 fighter jets, upgraded Patriot missile batteries, Abrams tanks, and other advanced systems that Ukraine doesn't have or is only beginning to receive. 
While these would not close the military gap with China, it would put Taiwan in a better position than Ukraine was at the start of its invasion. Then there is the problem of the potential invasion itself. Unlike Ukraine and Russia, Taiwan does not share a land border with China, but is separated by the Taiwan Strait, a body of water still over 80 miles at its narrowest point. That means any invasion would have to be an amphibious assault. The lowest estimates of the Chinese forces necessary for a successful campaign are over 300,000, and to achieve the 3 to 1 superiority in numbers that most commanders look for in offensive operations, the PLA would need an invasion force of 1.3 to 2.5 million. In comparison, D-Day, the largest amphibious invasion in history up to this point, had only 156,000 total troops. Additionally, Despite having better capabilities than Russia, the PLA has not seen combat since 1979, and few of its officers have real battle experience. Military experts still generally agree that China could take Taipei through massive force and numbers, but how easily and whether it could hold the territory for long are less clear. Additionally, the geography of Taiwan would work to its advantage in an invasion scenario. The country is actually made up of over 100 islands, many of them too small to see on a map. Most of the outer islands are packed with missiles, rocket systems, and artillery, while an extensive bunker system has been tunneled into the outer granite hills. The main island is rugged, with dense forests, and 258 mountains over 10,000 feet in elevation. And as China analyst Ian Easton has noted, unlike Normandy, the coastal terrain here is a defender's dream come true. Taiwan has only 14 small invasion beaches, and they are bordered by cliffs and urban jungles. Structures made of steel-reinforced concrete blanket the surrounding valleys. Taiwan gets hit by typhoons and earthquakes all the time, so each building and bridge is designed to withstand severe buffeting. This defensibility would also make it easier for an insurgency to form if China did take control of the island. Taiwan has a large and well-trained reserve force that could engage in guerrilla warfare and hide in tunnels and forests. And while gun ownership on the island is strictly regulated, Civilian arms training has increased in recent years. The owner of one shooting range in Taipei told Reuters that attendees had tripled or quadrupled since the Russian invasion of Ukraine. As one tattoo artist and reservist put it, most people don't want to go to war. I also don't want to go to war, but in the unfortunate event of this really happening, I will be mentally prepared. The terrain in Taiwan, with its mountains and forests, would also make it difficult for the PLA to locate and neutralize any resistance. This would make an occupation of the island difficult and costly, potentially leading to a protracted conflict which could wear down Chinese morale. But the obstacles don't end there. Another difficulty China would face in an invasion is international support for Taiwan. While Taiwan only has official relations with 13 other countries due to the PRC's international pressure, it maintains strong unofficial relations with the US, Japan, and other powerful states. The question of whether the US would aid Taiwan against an invasion has long been a critical question. Since it began relations with the PRC, the United States has maintained a position of strategic ambiguity, purposefully not making clear whether it would respond to an attack on Taiwan. However, with the recent heightened tensions, this policy has come into question. When asked in late 2022 whether he would send US forces to defend the island, President Joe Biden replied yes if in fact there was an unprecedented attack. Although a White House spokesperson later claimed the US policy had not changed, Biden's comments made it clear how vital Taiwan remains to US economic and military interests. If China launched a full-scale invasion, there is little doubt that the US would respond in some fashion, possibly through increased military aid to rebels, harsh economic sanctions on Chinese markets, or even the active deployment of advisors and troops to assist Taiwanese forces. U.S. involvement would present a serious obstacle to China occupying or annexing the island for any length of time, especially since the PLA's capabilities and resources are still far less substantial than the U.S. military. And with Taiwan in chaos, both China and the U.S. would have difficulty supplying their military-industrial complexes. This points to another major difficulty China would face in invading Taiwan, the profound disruption it would cause to the world economy. While the invasion of Ukraine created chaos in energy markets and supply chains around the world, a Chinese invasion of Taiwan would cause far greater damage, pointing to just how important the island is to the modern world. This is primarily due to semiconductors, which are necessary for nearly all modern electronics, from smartphones to GPS to fighter jets and missile systems. 
As the electronic industry in the US picked up in the 1960s and 70s, semiconductors became increasingly sophisticated, allowing for massive advances in computing power. But beginning in the 1980s, companies began to outsource the highly technical and expensive process of fabricating semiconductors to East Asian countries with cheaper labor. Over the next several decades, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, or TSMC, would become the most successful example of this, making itself into the largest and most advanced semiconductor manufacturer in the world. Taiwan's market dominance is such that today, more than 90% of global semiconductor manufacturing takes place on the island, making TSMC the 10th largest corporation in the world. And while the US is now taking strides to increase its domestic semiconductor manufacturing, Taiwan remains the linchpin to the industry, and thus to the modern digital economy. Here's the bad news. A Chinese invasion would catastrophically disrupt global supply chains and could lead to significant economic consequences, including shortages and recession. An active conflict on Taiwan would almost certainly slow down or halt fabrication of semiconductors and potentially damage or destroy the fabrication facilities. Furthermore, any military conflict would lead to a sharp decline in consumer confidence and businesses would hesitate to invest in the region. This would ultimately harm China's economic output for years to come, as it is heavily dependent on exports, as well as on the uninterrupted production of semiconductors, which make up more than 50% of Taiwan's exports to the PRC. But while the economic consequences would certainly damage the Chinese economy, that is no guarantee an invasion will not happen. Taiwan's geopolitical value is great enough that Beijing may risk the consequences just to control Taiwan's fabrication facilities, which would give both China complete control over the industry and completely seal off America's supply of the most advanced semiconductors. This could theoretically allow China to gain the upper hand in everything from commercial electronics to artificial intelligence and weapons production. For all these reasons and more, it is clear that any conflict between China and Taiwan would be complex and have far-reaching consequences. Whoever controls the supply chain for semiconductors will most likely become the dominant power of the 21st century. While such a conflict still seems unlikely today, geopolitical pressures could certainly create the conditions for a Chinese invasion. However, even if that takes place, there is reason to believe that such an invasion would face tremendous difficulties and require nearly all of China's military capabilities. But what do you think? How likely is a Chinese invasion of Taiwan? And how would China fare in such a scenario? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe for more content from military experts. If you go ahead and spin the proverbial wheel of global worry today, there's a good chance you'll land on the words China and World War III. Unfortunately, there are several reasons for that and they all lead to the question no one wants to think about. Is China getting ready for World War III? It's true that nowadays you can't go far without someone talking about the perils of Taiwanese reunification, artificial Chinese islands, Cold War 2.0, or the specifications of the latest hypersonic missile. Add to that the increasing frequency of Chinese incursions into Taiwanese airspace, Japan's recent decision to purchase hundreds of new weapons for its own defense, like these American-made Tomahawk missiles, and closer military cooperation between the US and Australia, and we are starting to see the signs of another global conflict on the horizon one that is likely to begin somewhere in the Indo-Pacific. It all adds up to another doomsday scenario waiting in the wings, and some believe it could take place as early as 2024. Does China have a World War III plan in place, and if so, what does it look like? China's rise over the past few decades seems to indicate that the worrisome and likely answer to the first question is yes, and here's why. Tensions between China and the West have not been this high in a long time. Rewind several decades and many experts would have laughed at you if you claimed you were a time traveler from the future and China posed a serious geopolitical threat to the international order. That's because the 1990s were a strange time, and not just because of the oversized genes and kids' obsession with green slime. It was a period of untempered Western optimism. Yep, you heard that right, optimism. From our pessimism-soaked vantage point today, the geopolitical arc of that decade was almost unicorn-like, a surreal period of national unity, hope, and security with the 9-11 terrorist attacks on the Twin Towers. But for a while, things seemed, well, good. Emerging victorious from its 45-year ideological standoff with the Soviet Union, 
for a brief unipolar moment in time, the United States enjoyed unmatched power and prestige on the global stage. There were no more near-peer threats. While terrorists and revolutionaries conspired at the peripheries of power, America's military and its coalition partners, equipped to the eyeballs with the latest technology and fresh off their rollicking victory in the Persian Gulf, bought into the idea that democracy was spreading and would continue to do so with assistance and persistence around the globe. It was in this geopolitical climate that things really started to change for China, not that many Western observers really noticed. Between 1949 and 1971, it had existed behind the Bamboo Curtain, a totalitarian dictatorship under the authoritarian communist revolutionary Mao Zedong. Things changed when the United States sought rapprochement with China in the 1970s, thereafter reopening diplomatic relations and turning China into a willing Cold War partner through strengthening economic relationships and a degree of exposure to the West it had not enjoyed since World War II. China started modernizing a lot. Americans profited, China grew. As China grew, Americans hoped the exposure to Western values and ideas would liberalize and democratize China. There were social and cultural reforms amid the modernization, yes, but not many. China's benign growth lulled the West into a false sense of security. Some pundits argue that it was in the 1990s, the heyday of American optimism, that China started really playing the long game, hatching a secret 50-year plan to achieve the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation after a century of downturns. Entangling its economy with the United States, it grew fast enough to convince the West it deserved a place in the World Trade Organization, the WTO, something it achieved by the early 2000s. Yes, we will play by the rules of international order, Chinese leaders proclaimed, with enough zeal to make their Western partners proud. It was around then its economy started booming, growing almost 10% every year for the next two decades. Between 1980 and 2000, its GDP quadrupled. Starting at under $90 billion in 1980, it now hovers around $13 trillion, the fastest growing increase in human history. Hundreds of millions of Chinese residents were lifted out of poverty as the country's economic potential skyrocketed. As globalization continued and China received hundreds of billions of dollars of global investment, it established a trade footprint to rival much of the rest of the world, providing cheap labor that built most of the products now adorning your home while becoming competitive in cutting-edge cyber, space, and technology sectors. It has long since become East Asia's economic titan par excellence. It thrived under the auspices of global capitalism. It took on some of the trappings of the West, especially in its business and trade practices, but it never really democratized. To this day, it maintains its communist, centralized, authoritarian regime under the singular vision of its latest ruler, Xi Jinping. And Xi has a vision all right. Having covertly flourished under the umbrella of American power for several decades, China is now preparing the next phase of its grand strategy to catapult itself into the realm of peerless global hegemon, one that can impose itself in its Indo-Pacific neighborhood at will while projecting enough global influence to shape the rules-based international order in its own image. It's taken them 14 five-year plans to get to that point, but they've finally arrived. Now China wants to build a community of common destiny, essentially a nice way of saying it wants to coercively achieve what it views the US doing all over the world, leading international organizations, becoming a political and economic model for developing countries, being able to project world-class military power all across the globe, all while leveraging its trade relationships, allies, and partners to achieve its interests, aka replace the United States as the world's leading state. They chose 2049 for the date to achieve all of this, the centenary of the founding of the People's Republic of China PRC. But each successive milestone for modernization has amped up the tension between China and the West. National security insiders have been sounding alarm bells for a decade now, but only recently have things started to get real. Over the past three decades, China has spent its way to military might. In 2019, it was spending more than South Korea, Japan, India, Russia, and Taiwan combined, accounting for over half of Asian GDP and half of all Asian military expenditures. China didn't have to just outspend their competition, however. Over the past decade, a growing number of Western defense officials have started kicking themselves for not realizing the pitfalls of economic interdependence with China. It's been no secret that for decades, Chinese spies have been stealing valuable intellectual property, including US military secrets. Just look at their latest stealth fighter, the J-20. It's a surreal mashup of the latest stealth technology, the type you might get if an American F-22, F-35, and a Russian MiG-144 walked into a bar, had one too many, and started spilling their secrets within earshot of a Chinese spy. China has stolen immense amounts of data too, some we unwittingly give them by opting in to use Chinese-owned platforms like TikTok, data that US officials claim gives them enough personal information to identify potential targets for intelligence collection and other subterfuge. Just like the West can and probably does, China uses this data to geo 
locate top national security targets, recruit spies, conduct massive remote cyber attacks, and steal military and technology secrets. The issue isn't just that China has shiny new advanced submarines, missiles, aircrafts, drones, and other toys to play with. It is that it's now looking like it has the logistics, infrastructure, and know-how to use them effectively. And that's something we need to explore further. As we all know, nation states can't just fling military power around the globe willy-nilly. You have to have the national industrial base to build up your power, the domestic support to use it, the transport infrastructure to move it, agreements in place to base it, and an effective doctrine and strategy to employ it. It took the United States four years of total war and victory in two theaters to emerge as a bona fide global superpower after World War II. Were it not for the destabilization in the aftermath of that war and the exigencies of the Cold War that followed it, it would not have many of the military basing agreements or the alliances and partnerships it now enjoys around the world today. Many of those relationships and the infrastructure sustaining them took decades, even generations, to build. And today, that is something we often take for granted. But not China. They know the price of obscurity and the difficulty of restoring national power and prestige back to superpower levels. Their long-term strategy, in part, is to achieve the same degree of global aid agency that the United States enjoys. It too wants bases for its military all over the world, flourishing economic relationships and safe trade routes for its commercial fleet. Without a world war to create the conditions for its rise to power, China has had to engineer its rise artificially, partially through guile and subterfuge, partially using state-sponsored initiatives that scream, we are trying to go global and we will make it happen whether you like it or not. One of China's global projects that stands out from the rest in terms of ambition, scale and significance, the One Belt Road Initiative, or Belt and Road Initiative. Initiative, BRI. Much like the ancient Silk Road that connected Chinese traders and goods with rich foreign markets, the BRI strives to achieve the same degree of global influence for China in the modern era. To understand China, you have to grapple with the BRI. Many analysts view the project as China's answer to the Marshall Plan, a post-World War II economic assistance package that sought to revitalize war-torn Europe. Unlike the Marshall Plan, the BRI is extended to any willing economic partner. Formal agreements between China the host nation to build economic and political ties generally precede a litany of Chinese investment, funding, infrastructure projects, tech collaboration, and more. In the process, China gets access to ports and airfields, markets for state-owned companies, safeguards for international trade, and international influence. For years, the BRI has been the litmus test for global Chinese power projection. The belt connects China with Europe and the other dozen nations on its borders via a series of overland trade routes, while the road refers to its maritime interests, fueling stations, ports, industry, infrastructure scattered throughout Southeast Asia and the Indian Ocean. A great example of periphery diplomacy, BRI projects can now be found from the Himalayas to the Horn of Africa and Mediterranean Basin. It has funded infrastructure deals in Malaysia, gas pipelines and railroads in Nigeria, Egypt, Ethiopia and Kenya, maintains port operations in Greece, projects in Sri Lanka and has other projects in the works. The West has viewed the BRI warily. Some criticize China's debt trap diplomacy, a tactic of luring economically vulnerable states into taking out Chinese loans and then jacking up the rates to unpayable levels as a form of coercion over the government in question. Others fear China's growing telecommunications and economic influence over Europe and the global South. But there still hasn't been a really unified response, and China continues to shovel money into its initiative, with another $124 billion pledged in 2007. One of the big warning signs came that same year, when China decided to establish a hub in Djibouti, a developing nation strategically located in the Gulf of Aden on the Horn of Africa. China had essentially said it would never open an official military base there, and then they did, calling it a logistics facility, even though PLA Navy Marines and other forces regularly mull about with armored vehicles and artillery. It is considering similar projects in Cambodia, Myanmar, Thailand, Singapore, Indonesia, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, United Arab Emirates, Kenya, Seychelles, Tanzania, Angola, and Tajikistan, evidence of China's expanding military footprint around the globe. These military bases hold great potential for regional destabilization. Such developments are a warning that countries can become unwitting partners to PRC military expansion by giving China access to airfields and ports it would otherwise lack. A global footprint, therefore, is a prerequisite for China's national rejuvenation and has certainly empowered its actions at home. Maritime disputes in the waters around China are so common they've almost become normalized. These waters in the South China Sea are heavily trafficked, including some of the richest shipping lanes in the world. Xi Jinping made a promise not to militarize certain islands China artificially built in the South China Sea. Now the Parcel and Spratly Islands are militarized and can be used to intimidate and coerce coastal states throughout the region. The bullying continues in the East China Sea as Chinese merchant vessels regularly dominate lucrative shipping lanes. Coast Guard, military, and commercial ships deprive foreign fishermen of access to resources, and policymakers make ambitious maritime claims that 
that are frequently rejected as lacking basis in international law. For the record, territorial waters are considered up to 12 nautical miles off a country's coastline, a fact China ignores. China wants to monopolize the natural gas, oil, and hydrocarbon reserves it feels it has a claim to, even hundreds of miles away. A lot of the tension arises near the Senkaku Islands, a group of uninhabited islands that in 1971 reverted back to Japanese administrative control under the Okinawa Reversion Agreement. Over these seas, China has set out to create air defense identification zones, increasing its operational reach even further. Taken together, China's economic and cultural influence combined with its renewed military strength add up into a scary equation for Beijing's neighbors. There have also been regular border conflicts on the China-India frontier since a PRC instigated clash in 2020 left dozens dead. India claims China has the onus to withdraw, and they haven't. South Korea is worried about North Korea, China's only major Asian ally, doing something stupid. Even Japan, you know, those guys who were so committed to pacifism after World War II that they called their military a self-defense force, are now so alarmed they're arming themselves with hundreds of Tomahawk missiles, writing counter-strike capabilities into their fighting doctrine, and conducting joint military exercises with American and Australian forces, an image that surely would have made our grandparents both proud and perplexed. And nobody should be more scared than Taiwan. The small independent island nation will almost undoubtedly be ground zero in any World War III scenario with China. Here's why. China is bent on reuniting Taiwan with mainland China. The spat goes back to World War II, when nationalist rebels fled to the island and created a vibrant democratic society, one China refuses to acknowledge or respect. Ever since, China has wanted Taiwan back more than a prepubescent teen who accidentally traded their holographic first edition Charizard for a bag of potato chips. And this is a problem, since the United States has all but formally pledged to intervene and protect Taiwan in the event China decides to invade. And boy has it probably thought about it. In August 2022, the China State Council produced a white paper whose table of contents made China's position on the issue explicitly clear. Chapter 1. Taiwan is part of China. This is an indisputable fact. Chapter 2. Resolute efforts of the CCP to realize China's complete reunification. Chapter 3. China's complete reunification is a process that cannot be halted. Chapter 4. National reunification in a new era. Chapter 5. Bright prospects for a peaceful reunification. It's okay, you can tell us how you really feel, Beijing. We are one China, the paper alleges, and Taiwan is part of China. This is an indisputable fact supported by history and the law. Taiwan has never been a state. Its status as part of China is unalterable. The CPC is committed to the historic mission of resolving the Taiwan question and realizing China's complete reunification. So China is overwhelmingly focused on reunifying Taiwan. They say they won't use force. Hmm. Where have we heard that before? Authoritarian leader claims he won't use force to reunify territory he believes is rightfully his. But hey, this type of tension has been brewing since the 1996 Taiwan Strait Crisis, when the PRC had a showdown with an American carrier group after conducting a bunch of missile tests in the Taiwan Strait. The outcome of the Taiwan issue has real global bearings. Taiwan is the epicenter of the global semiconductor industry. What's a semiconductor, you say? Anything that has an electronic chip. Your phone, your computer, your wireless modem, your electronic toys, your average ballistic missile, medical instruments, televisions, cutting-edge satellites, they all rely on semiconductors for computing. It is a $556 billion industry, one that for better or for worse hinges on the whims of a Taiwan-China-US love triangle. You see, the US sells 46% of global semiconductors, but only manufactures 12% of them. China consumes the most, importing $378 billion worth and putting what it buys into 35% of the world's devices. And Taiwan, as you might expect, has 53% of the global semiconductor market share and produces 90% of the world's most advanced ones you might see in cars, smartphones, and military tech. That's a serious share of the market. Interdependence is a problem. The US is now trying to decouple itself from the Taipei-Beijing chip drama and become self-sufficient. But Taiwan's predominance on the global chip market is one reason Beijing literally cannot afford to let Taiwan continue to independently exist. It needs to set the terms of trade in the region, not Taiwan and other Western-facing nations. Otherwise, it will always be seen as a second-rate power. What does this all amount to? Well, this situation has produced the worst security crisis in the Taiwan Strait in 20 years. China means business. As Taiwan becomes more eager to carve out its independence from the mainland, China views its very sovereign existence as an existential threat. China worries about being hamstrung behind the first island chain, a series of nations that includes the Philippines, Borneo, Japan, and the Ryukyu Islands, that it fears can contain and limit its ability to project power beyond its shores. Taiwan is at the heart of this island chain, 
a cornerstone of Western power in the region, one that perpetually transmits dangerously subversive messages of Western-backed prosperity while it remains independent. With Taiwan under America's orbit, it is a thorn in Xi's side. With a reunified Taiwan, China gains the ability to break the first island chain and wield influence deep into the Pacific. Predictably, China is throwing caution to the wind regarding Taiwan's territorial sovereignty, violating Taiwan's Air Defense Identification Zone ADIS, and the median line dividing the Taiwan Strait once considered as an invisible barrier between the two entities with frightful regularity. Between 1954 and 2020, there were only four Chinese violations of these internationally recognized demarcations. In 2020 alone, there were 380. There were more than double that number the following year with 969 incursions. The biggest came on October 4, 2021, a day that saw 56 aircraft enter Taiwan's air defense zone, unironically coinciding with China's National Day of Celebration. By May of this year, there had been a 50% increase in the number of incursions over the same span in 2021. Partially to send a supportive signal in response, the US conducted a series of high-profile political visits to the island. China didn't buy it. To them, the visits were needlessly escalatory. They responded with more overflights, setting a new record for monthly sorties. Since the the summer, the PLA Air Force PLAF, has flown over 1,000 sorties near Taiwan, 40% of them in the ADIS or over the median line. Today, it is coming into Taiwanese airspace on a near-daily basis, ramping up its intimidation efforts around Taiwan in other ways too, from anti-submarine warfare, drone reconnaissance, and cyber attacks to the growth of its naval and missile presence in the region. China's end goal is clear. Taiwan has voiced alarm and concern over the near-constant encirclement drills, labeling them as escalatory equivalent of a sea and air block of the island. If these are, in fact, dress rehearsals for a full-scale invasion, China will continue to ramp up the pressure as the time goes on. The on-ramp to war, then, is there, and it's volatile. Some pundits compare the existing slate of geopolitical relationships in the Indo-Pacific to the entangled alliance systems in Europe on the eve of World War I. This is, at least, a line of reasoning. Hal Brands, a prominent political scientist at John Hopkins University, has espoused comparing Japanese, Australian, and American collaboration as a latter-day triple entente pre-World War coalition that sought to contain Imperial Germany in the Western Pacific. It didn't take much for the World War I powder keg to erupt in the Balkans, fueling a chain reaction that resulted in the First World War. If history is any guide, it won't take much to escalate a regional clash in the Indo-Pacific into a global war either. It is here in Asia's maritime heartland where all the ingredients of a global cataclysm are conspiring against the post-Cold War period of peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific, one analyst observed. It's also here where the naked edge of China's hegemonic ambitions are on full display, with dire consequences for smaller neighbors and the broader liberal international order. Here lies the defining geopolitical dilemma of our times. Well put, so how are the major players gearing up to play their part? We've already talked about China, at least their geopolitical maneuvering. Militarily, they've been following the same path, modernizing at an impressive rate to add bite to their bark as they pursue their strategy of recasting the global governance system in its own image. Its to-do list has, so far, taken a page right out of a America's playbook, China has adopted the model that made America powerful, first building a moderately prosperous society in all respects, then using that as a foundation to build a truly competitive, world-class military. The fusion of civil military power is deliberate. Industrial developments in quantum computing, AI, robotics, and biotechnology not only help China become competitive in the civilian sphere, these technologies can be appropriated to help the Chinese network their military forces. And make no mistake, this is something it is eagerly doing. To create a state-of-the-art air force, it has set a goal to fully network its combined and joint chains of command by 2027. Advancing dual-use technologies, ones that can benefit civilian and military infrastructure alike, will enable rapid information exchange between its army, navy, air, rocket, and yes, even space forces. Easily setting the Chinese military apart from anything America's nearest peer, the Russians have been able to achieve in Ukraine if they succeed. For a while now, the CCP has portrayed a West in relative decline. This narrative fuels Beijing's hopes it can supplant the United States as the preeminent global superpower. And to be fair, things in the United States haven't been all that peachy over the past decade or so. Race riots, populism, rampant misinformation and fake news, capital uprisings, COVID, political polarization, mistrust, and fear have exposed internal fractures and brought American democracy to its weakest point in generations. But America has been gearing up for its marathon clash against China for years now, in the hopes that if things did spill over into a full-scale war, it would be ready. American leaders, regardless of political party, are now mostly unified on this. They know the coming struggle will be ideological and cultural as much as it will be an in-and-out technological, economic, and military competition. Still, it wasn't really until
until 2018 that the United States officially changed its strategic posture to address China's rise. At the tail end of two fruitless decades in the Middle East, its national strategy shifted to recognize China, not terrorists or Russia, as the main peer adversary. This year, the Biden administration updated its national security strategy but did not depart from the rhetoric or strategic competition that pervaded earlier iterations. American strategy emphasizes this as the decisive decade to get ahead and win the competition for the 21st century. Some people criticize American strategy for reviving antiquated Cold War mentalities, painting over Soviet tropes with Chinese skins in another zero-sum adversarial competition that could needlessly escalate into war. Vastly different political systems aside, there are more similarities than differences between China and the United States than there were between the US and the Soviet Union, especially in the realm of economics. The two competing powers are not mutually exclusive, but disagreements and mistrust are common enough destabilizers that many fear the status quo can't be maintained for long. China is aware that it still cannot compete with the United States in many areas. The United States Navy, for instance, though technically smaller than the Chinese Navy, continues to patrol strategic waterways in the Indo-Pacific, ensuring vital sea lanes remain open for free and flourishing international trade. American carrier groups have bases throughout the first island chain. American submarines and aircraft tend to be more robust, possessing longer range and better stealth technology than their Chinese counterparts. Chinese jet engines are not as advanced as American ones. Its military suffers quality control issues with its imbalanced admixture of antiquated and modern military systems and vehicles. Its logistics and transport capabilities lag far behind their globe-trotting American adversary. And above all, the Chinese lack concrete fighting experience, having fought and lost their last major operation in Vietnam in 1979. Experience the United States coming off its own unfortunate Middle Eastern odyssey nevertheless has in spades. But the PLA's military strategy is catered to overcome these shortcomings. In a World War III scenario, especially one involving Taiwan, the United States, its allies and partners, namely Japan, South Korea, Singapore, the Philippines, and possibly India, would have to operate in China's neck of the woods at the tail end of an incredibly long logistics network. The United States' geographic location makes it reliant on small overseas bases refueling tankers, transport vehicles, and carriers to convey and sustain its units abroad. While China continues modernizing its forces and develops its own expeditionary capabilities, it has developed an anti-access area denial A2AD, strategy to keep America and its allies at bay in the Indo-Pacific. The strategy has seen China prioritize the construction of a bristling array of ground-based missiles, naval assets, and aircraft equipped with the latest air-to-air -air and air-to-ground missiles that can outrange their American counterparts and thus discourage them from intervening in a regional conflict. This active defense strategy will make American intervention in Taiwan both risky and potentially deadly. Is all of this really leading to a future world war? Most security experts will be the first to tell you that the war against China is anything but inevitable. If both powers can learn to manage their competitive relationship, they can peacefully coexist despite their adversarial posture. But wars can ignite from inauspicious sources. As Peter Warren Singer, a strategist and senior fellow at a think tank called New America and award-winning author, has written, in the coming decades, a war might ignite accidentally, such as by two opposing warships trading paint near a reef not even marked on a nautical chart. Or it could slow burn and erupt as a reordering of the global system in the late 2020s, a period at which China's military buildup is on pace to match the US. Singer has spent a lot of time thinking about the type of war we might expect in the Pacific. The war, he argues, will be a multi-domain conflict, meaning it will transpire in the traditional domains of air, sea, and land, as well as futuristic domains like space, the lifeblood of modern military communications, and cyber, where digital military systems and civilian infrastructure may be prone to attack. The United States has not waged a multi-domain war against a peer adversary since 1945, and so many of the lessons it learned in Iraq and Afghanistan may not be as relevant to a war with China. Likewise, America's traditional approach to wars has been to overmatch its enemies, relying on military technology at least one generation ahead to produce qualitative advantages on the battlefield. US forces can't count on overmatch in the future, Singer argues, since much of America's intellectual property has been stolen outright by Chinese spies, while its R&D has been accelerating its experimentation with space, drone, hypersonic, and cyber technology. Technologies. Still, experimentation is not the same as full-scale acquisition and implementation. China's two biggest vulnerabilities are historically significant, that it is reliant on imported semiconductors and microchips, things it cannot produce itself, and second, that it is heavily reliant on imported oil. The situation is not unlike Japan's in the early 20th century. A rapidly modernizing imperial power with a plucky navy totally reliant on oil imports to sustain itself. As it started to expand into China and the Pacific, seeking access to raw resources, the United States embarked the export of oil and other military 
goods. Pearl Harbor, the start of the last war for the United States fought in the Pacific, came in part because Japanese leaders viewed the war with the United States as inevitable. It needed an independent oil supply, something it would seek in the oil-rich Dutch East Indies, and it knew if it attacked, the US would come knocking, so it needed to prevent its own geopolitical encirclement by striking a knockout blow on the American fleet, then stationed at Pearl Harbor. It had a narrow window, given its limited oil reserves at home, and so they attacked. Some say another Pearl Harbor is brewing, this time with Taiwan at the epicenter. Reunifying the island by force will give China access to the semiconductors it needs, but it would have to ensure that the United States could not meaningfully intervene. Toshi Yoshihara, a China expert who works at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessment, has warned that the PLA's views on a Pacific conflict are consistent with Pearl Harbor, and that they are predisposed to delivering a decisive first blow against US-deployed forces in the Western Pacific, particularly those in Japan. Chinese doctrine indeed emphasizes surprise at the outset of war, all part of a counter-intervention strategy to keep the Beijing, Tianjin, Shanghai, Nanjing, Guangzhou, Shenzhen corridor open. Its precision strike arsenal, primarily made up of DF-21C missiles, are capable of hitting any target on the entire Japanese archipelago, while its DF-26 missiles can fire conventional and nuclear warheads almost 4,000 kilometers, far enough to strike the strategic US base at Guam. In all likelihood, if it were to spring an amphibious invasion of Taiwan, China's tactic would be to saturate America's roving carrier groups and their escorts with waves of ballistic anti-ship missiles, overcome their defenses, and send billions of dollars of valuable equipment to the bottom of the ocean before it can be brought to bear. This would help overcome the early gulf in military shipping, aircraft, and tonnage between the two sides. They would then target vulnerable American sensor aircraft, refueling tankers, and cargo ships to curtail America's ability to get close to Chinese territory. The United States has far more battle force missiles than the Chinese, meaning the total number of missiles capable of being fired in combat before resupply, but the Chinese do have enough to saturate and destroy three American carrier groups simultaneously, potentially turning the American naval forces in the Pacific into a moot point before a war begins. There is even evidence that they have been practicing such preemptive strikes in the Gobi Desert in western China. Such a move might be good in the short term, but short-term tactical victories do not win wars. China would then have to contend with the galvanization of American morale, the mobilization of its entire economy for war, and the possibility of intervention from many of its regional and global partners, one of whom is Japan, the world's third largest economy with a powerful navy of its own. If China went to war, it would be anything but subtle. For an operation that big in the 21st century, it's almost impossible to achieve the element of surprise. Observers would see a flurry of activity in China's eastern and southern theater commands opposite at Taiwan for weeks and even months prior to invasion. Ports of embarkation, airfields, field hospitals, and mobile command posts buzzing, units deploying with oil and gas pipelines, transport ships loading, commercial ships looking to provoke and escalate. The forces far from Taiwan would be placed on high alert. National mobilization efforts would increase and the military would begin commandeering civilian vessels, ferries, aircrafts, trucks, and trains. China would have to surge its production of ballistic long-range missiles and cruise missiles for a massive anti-air, anti-ship, air-to-air, and beach bombardment. It would need to achieve a degree of economic self-sufficiency in anticipation for the sanctions that would undoubtedly be implemented. It would be a lot like what we saw in Ukraine with Russian forces massing on the border, not unlike a classic game of risk. You mass on your enemy's border, you claim you come in peace, you are only there to defend yourself, you claim. Meanwhile, battle plans are circulating and you are one move away from starting World War III. What's next? Unlike the Japanese at Pearl Harbor who failed to authorize a third strike to neutralize the American carrier and submarine fleet, the Chinese would have to find a way to continually pressure the Americans in the Pacific to deter further intervention. Making it so prohibitively costly, its morale and will to assist Taiwan would crumble. An invasion of Taiwan would be tantamount to Germany's invasion of the Rhineland in 1936. Unless the West is willing to stand up and deter Chinese aggression from the start, an invasion could spark emergency rearmament programs, mass mobilization, and quickly escalate into a global war. War. She and the CCP are no fools, however. They know it would be a Rubicon moment if they were to invade Taiwan, something they could never walk back from. They will have been watching Putin's adventure in Ukraine with great interest, observing firsthand how aggressive regional land grabs can spiral into an out-and-out, no-holds-barred contest against deceptively capable nations with Western backing. They know if they act, they will immediately forfeit their national image abroad and become international pariahs. In the end, China will have to figure out what ultimate victory would look like and if it will be worth the price of an all-out war. The ball is already in their court, reunifying Taiwan by force is a massive obstacle. Overturning an entire global order is even harder by an order of magnitude. Could China do it? Is war really inevitable? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. A potential hostile encounter with China now dominates the United States military planning and vice versa.
What would a war look like? Who would win? Before we get to that, let's take a minute to explain why our military experts have decided to discuss this potentially very real and, quite frankly, terrifying scenario. After the end of World War II and especially the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, the United States emerged as the world's preeminent power, supreme in military, economic, technological, and even cultural influence. After 1991, the United States was so strong that some experts believed it had transcended superpower status. According to their theory, it had instead ascended into a hyperpower, a state that dominates all other states in every domain in the international system. The world had become a unipolar one, even leading some observers in the 1990s and part of the 2000s, most famously Francis Fukuyama, to declare an end of history and the final triumph of liberal democracy as the last form of human political organization. However, the 2000s and 2010s threw some cold water on this theory. Costly American military expeditions in the Middle East, the 2008 financial crisis, Russia's expansionist ambitions under Vladimir Putin, Iran and North Korea's nuclear programs, and above all, the economic and military rise of China, all undermine the notion of unipolarity. By the middle of the 2010s, the Pentagon proposed its third offset strategy, which tacitly acknowledged that the unipolar moment was, if not over, at least under threat by the emerging coalition of authoritarian powers, led by China, who were opposed to the international order led by the United States. The United States was therefore shifting its military posture away from the counterterrorism and counterinsurgency campaigns which dominated its strategy following 9-11, when the unipolar moment was near its height, and toward competition with and deterrence of other states, especially China. This is why the US is currently heavily oriented toward preparing for a potential adversarial encounter with China. Let's dive into what kind of conflict might unfold and which side could emerge victorious. We can begin with a comparison of the size of the two forces. With 1.4 billion people, China is the second most populous country in the world, having been surpassed by India in April 2023. It has the world's largest military with almost 2.2 million active personnel. The United States military ranks third in size with almost 1.4 million active duty personnel. When adding in reservists, the numbers increase to 3.35 million and 2.2 million, respectively. China also has the world's largest navy, with 425 fleet units in its active naval inventory as of August 21, 2023. This number excludes smaller patrol ships and other auxiliaries, presumably its huge fishing fleet that has acted as a de facto maritime militia in disputed waters. Meanwhile, the United States has 243 units in its active naval inventory, excluding smaller patrol ships and other auxiliaries. The United States has the world's largest air force, with 5,217 active aircraft as of 2022. China ranks a distant third, with 1,991. When counting the total number of military aircraft with all branches combined, China's numerical disadvantage in the skies becomes more pronounced, as the United States has 13,247 aircraft among all of its military branches while China ranks a very distant third again at 3,285. When it comes to air power at sea, the United States has 2,464 aircraft, while China's People's Liberation Army Navy PLAN, has only 437. This is an important distinction and reveals that many of China's advantages are only surface deep. The numerical difference in the makeup of the two forces is important. A war between the United States and China would take place in the area close to the Chinese mainland, in the territory around the first island chain, a string of countries that stretch from Japan to Indonesia. China would be able to concentrate all of its resources there, and its supply lines would be much shorter. In contrast, the United States has global commitments, with Russia exerting pressure on Eastern Europe, Iran and its allies in the Middle East, and North Korea on the Korean Peninsula. All of these hotspots demand America's attention, the United States would also need to ship its supplies and replacements across the Pacific. These supply lines would be long and vulnerable to attack, the tyranny of distance. The United States has qualitative advantages, however. China's army has not seen major combat operations in almost half a century. The last time was the Sino-Vietnamese War of 1979, where the PLA had a poor showing indeed against the Vietnamese. 
In contrast, the United States military has had decades of combat experience and a buildup of institutional knowledge that the PLA simply does not have. It has more experienced soldiers, sailors, marines, and officers. The Chinese military has engaged in a large buildup and conducted extensive drills and war games with partners such as Russia, but there is no substitute for the real thing. Russia's poor performance in Ukraine shows that, and its armed forces had more experience than China's currently does. The United States Air Force not only has numerical superiority over the People's Liberation Army Air Force, but a qualitative advantage in those planes. Although it may not seem this way at first, China has one fifth-generation fighter jet, the Chengdu J-20. China may have over 200 of these in service, a number which could hit as high as 1,000 by 2030 if current production rates continue. It may also have over 240 of the advanced fourth-generation plus J-16 fighters in service. This is a formidable force for the PLAAF. In contrast, the United States has only built 187 of its best fifth-generation fighter jets, the F-22 Raptor. The last one was delivered in 2012, and the Air Force has no plans to order any more. However, the United States can supplement the extremely high-quality Raptor with the fifth-generation F-35 Lightning II. Over 960 F-35s have been delivered as of August 2023. The United States also has thousands of advanced fourth-generation fighter jets like the F-15 Eagle, F-16 Fighting Falcon, and the F-18 Super Hornet available. And all of them come with better trained and more experienced pilots than their Chinese counterparts. Although China has closed the gap, the United States is still supreme in the world's skies, and in an all-out air battle, the Americans would eventually establish air superiority. The war at sea is also not favorable to China. The People's Liberation Army Navy may have a bigger fleet in terms of sheer numbers, but the United States Navy has purposely chosen to pursue a different strategy than its Chinese counterpart. Numbers aren't everything. Many of the Chinese vessels are small and would prove relatively poor in a military confrontation. In contrast, the USN operates sturdier, more powerful vessels. For example, the PLAN has three aircraft carriers, only one of which uses a modern catapult system. The USN has 11, all of which are more modern than the first two Chinese carriers. China has plans to make more aircraft carriers in the years to come, but as of now, the United States has a significant advantage. Additionally, China has a serious shortage of trained naval aviators. The PLAN is trying its best to catch up, but it's still far short. As a conflict between the United States and China would mainly be fought in the seas and skies around the first island chain, with comparatively limited land operations, the traditional balance of power should favor the United States in a head-to-head -head confrontation. However, China has recognized this and has adapted with a strategy of anti-access area denial, A2AD. One of the things that marked the United States' emergence as a supposed hyperpower following the end of the Cold War was its ability to project power anywhere on the globe within hours. Perhaps one of the best examples was the Navy SEAL raid on Osama bin Laden's compound in 2011. This complicated military operation occurred without the Pakistani government's knowledge, and there was little that Pakistan could do about it except raise a protest afterward. After the end of the Cold War, the United States had no peer competitor in the international system, which could prevent it from using its military resources in the way it wanted. However, this began to change with China's military buildup. China's A2AD strategy sounds complicated, but it's relatively simple. First, it is to deny its adversaries freedom of movement in the disputed region, anti-access. To do this, it will utilize certain assets, especially cheap precision ballistic and cruise missiles, to destroy key targets in offensive strikes. The second leg of the strategy is to use defensive systems to deny the enemy the ability to operate in territory controlled by it or other friendly powers. For example, China would try to use its stockpile of thousands of cheap ballistic missiles to destroy expensive American ships, especially aircraft carriers, bases, and long supply lines to prevent the United States from moving into disputed regions like the South China Sea or the Taiwan Strait. Cheap ballistic missiles destroying expensive carrier groups would not only prove deadly and costly, it would prevent the United States from being able to project its power into the first island chain and the Chinese interior. This is the opposite of what happened during the third Taiwan Strait crisis in 1995-96, when the United States sent two carrier groups to the area. The Chinese did not have the resources to deal with this projection of American power, 
and had to back down, the story would be very different today and the move far more dangerous on the part of the United States. Chinese air and missile attacks on US naval assets, supply lines, and bases in Japan, South Korea, and even as far out as Guam would take advantage of the tyranny of distance to prevent the United States from being able to fight the war for the long haul. The United States might be able to establish air and naval superiority with its higher quality planes and ships in a confrontation, but it could have a hard time replacing losses and bringing more resources over. Meanwhile, China would be operating close to its own territory. The supply lines would be much shorter and easier to defend with its air and sea defense systems, and all of China's resources would be concentrated here. In addition to these kinetic assets, China has tried to develop its electronic and cybernetic warfare capabilities to further disrupt the US military capability. China's military buildup and its A2 AD weapons has posed the most serious challenge to US military might since the Cold War. It is why many experts believe that the United States is slowly but steadily losing its traditional military superiority in the Indo-Pacific region. To defeat China's A2 AD strategy, the Pentagon developed its third offset strategy. China hopes that the development of advanced A2 AD capabilities will deter the United States from even disputing its expansionist moves. This is why for the Pentagon, it is important to maintain forward presence capability. It must be able to defeat the attempts to impede the movement of American military forces and surge them forward in a combat-credible posture. According to the US Army's Center for Lessons Learned, the third offset strategy involves forces that are or can rapidly get forward, survive a withering Chinese or Russian assault, and blunt the adversary's aggression. It is almost reminiscent of a boxer trying to duck and slip past a barrage of long jabs to get inside his opponent's range and deliver power blows. The United States is currently developing technologies to better prepare it to pursue this strategy. For example, these new technologies would involve better artificial intelligence to enable human officers to make faster and more informed decisions. The integration of human and unmanned platforms, like the Sea Hunter autonomous drone ship, would also be part of the third offset strategy. Other technologies like ship-borne hypersonic missiles and the Helios laser system can also be considered part of the third offset strategy, as it is hoped that the laser will add a layer of protection to the US Navy's ships from the Chinese ballistic and cruise missile threat. The laser is also ideal for countering drones. The first Helios laser began seeing service in the third quarter of fiscal year 2022, and the Navy requested $35 million in its 2023 budget for Helios systems when they will begin to become operational at sea. However, as dazzling as the third offset strategy technologies are, they are still works in progress. The United States neglected countermeasures against China's A2 AD strategy as it pursued its counterinsurgency and counterterrorism efforts in the war on terror. Under current conditions, the United States military still uses many technologies and systems that are not well designed to counter the strategy China is pursuing. China still cannot defeat the United States in a head-to-head -head military confrontation, but because of geography, it does not necessarily need to. All it needs to do is prevent the United States from projecting enough power past the first island chain to defeat its expansionist ambitions. As part of its strategy, American military bases in Japan would be targeted in the opening shots of the war, to destroy troops and equipment, prevent the stockpiling of supplies, and disrupt the United States' strategy in the region Air defense systems would take down some of the incoming missiles, but China has thousands in its arsenal, and its attacks would certainly do a great deal of damage. War games done at the Pentagon and defense think tanks have repeatedly confirmed these disadvantages. In a January 2023 scenario run by the Center for Strategic and International Studies, the United States, with the help of Japan and Taiwan, defeated an amphibious invasion of Taiwan, but the casualties were enormous, with losses in dozens of ships hundreds of aircraft, and tens of thousands of military personnel, with the US position on the international stage undermined for years afterward. China suffered heavily too, however CSIS warned that deterrence needed to be strengthened immediately. Other war games were even less kind. A 2020 war game run by the Pentagon over Taiwan and other scenarios had the United States failing miserably because gathering ships, aircraft, and other forces in a way that would let them reinforce one another made them sitting ducks for Chinese missile attacks. To make matters worse, the United States lost access to its electronic networks from the get-go, upending the information-dominance strategy it has used so successfully starting in the Gulf War. 
In response to the 2020 war game, the Pentagon is looking to shore up its contested logistics, possibly through the use of rockets to fly above the war zone. It's also looking to find ways to aggregate power virtually rather than physically. Then Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff General John Hyten said of it, you have to aggregate the mass fires, but it doesn't have to be a physical aggregation. It could be a virtual aggregation for multiple domains. Acting at the same time under a single command structure allows the fire to come in on anybody. It allows you to disaggregate to survive. He admitted this was exceedingly difficult to do, however. Finally, the United States would need to improve the defense of its networks against hackers with a hacker-proof combat cloud. For now, though, these things are only speculation. What is not, however, is the United States' advantage in submarine warfare. China's missile capability has made it increasingly dangerous for the United States and its allies to project power behind the first island chain with surface ships, but the submarine force is much better protected. That's why China raised such a big protest about the AUKUS deal that would give Australia nuclear-powered submarines. Submarines are ideal for the implementation of the United States' third offset strategy. American nuclear-powered submarines can operate for months. They are quiet and dive deep, making them difficult to detect. They can also launch conventional or nuclear-armed ballistic or cruise missiles to strike sensitive targets. The United States submarine fleet would make any invasion of Taiwan or other amphibious operations in the First Island chain a costly proposition for the Chinese military. The presence of these submarines also gives the United States significant conventional or nuclear first strike options to attack targets on land, such as Chinese military installations, which house the ballistic missiles that are such a threat to surface ships and land bases. China's PLAN is trying to close the submarine gap. At the moment, though, the bulk of its underwater fleet consists of diesel-electric submarines. They are quieter than nuclear submarines when running on electric power, but most surface to charge their batteries and are much louder when running on diesel power during this process. As of March 2023, China has a fleet of 56 submarines, but only six of them are nuclear-powered. The disparity means that the United States can carry out stealthier and longer operations under the water than China's navy can. If a war did break out between the United States and China, the US submarine fleet would swing into action and attack Chinese naval assets, land bases, and shipping. The latter is especially important and reveals the United States' ace in the hole. China depends heavily on foreign food and energy imports. From its perspective, China's attempt to expand its influence in the South China Sea can be seen as an act of self-preservation. Critical shipping routes worth trillions of dollars go through these waters. Whoever controls them not only controls those dollars, but the ability for the countries in the area to access the resources. If China succeeds in closing the South China Sea shipping lanes, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and other American allies in the region would have a far harder time importing the resources they need. The same principle applies with China, however. A blockade of strategic shipping lanes such as the Strait of Malacca and the Strait of Luzon would cripple the commerce China depends on that comes through these straits, and much of its commerce is vital for its basic needs. While some of the Chinese missiles can reach that far, the assets being used to enforce the blockade would be better protected by distance and have more time to react to an attack. China is testing hypersonic missiles and is regarded as being ahead of the United States in the race for these weapons that would help its offensive reach. However, they are not ready for prime time and have not been widely deployed in the Chinese military yet. China would also greatly risk its naval and air assets in an attempt to disrupt the blockade. It would be the type of head-on confrontation with the United States Navy and Air Force that would put the Chinese military at a disadvantage. China may be the world's largest manufacturing nation, but it is still unable to feed or fuel itself, while the United States can. This would be the ultimate disadvantage in a wartime scenario, reminiscent of Germany's geographical disadvantages in World War I, when the Allied blockade deprived Germany of resources and slowly strangled it into starvation and submission. In a full-scale war, the United States would attempt a similar strategy. While China's missiles would ensure that the United States could not pull off a blockade in the same way the Royal Navy did in World War I, China would still be hard-pressed to break through it. So while the United States would be in danger in a confrontation in an area like the South China Sea or the Taiwan Strait, it would not necessarily need to go there until China is steadily worn down by the blockade and attrition. The United States still has a military advantage over China. But China is trying its best to close that gap. 
with its population starting to decline and economic growth slowing down, the dangers of a war breaking out in the Indo-Pacific may be increasing, since the Chinese Communist leadership may begin to feel like its window of opportunity to remake the order in the region is closing. Regardless of how it would be fought, a war between the United States and China, even if contained, would be bloody and come at a huge price tag. Deterrence and diplomacy are more vital than ever. But what do you think? Who would have the advantage? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. China's plan to invade the relatively small yet globally significant island of Taiwan may be hitting a major roadblock. The Philippines, backed by the US, could influence China's invasion plans in a major China-Taiwan conflict. But what is it about the Philippines that makes them play such a pivotal role in this scenario? In the year 2023, Taiwan became the most strategically important piece of real estate on Earth. This de facto independent island nation 110 miles off the coast of the Chinese mainland sits at the center of the world's economic and geopolitical fault lines. Since it came to power in 1949, the Chinese Communist Party has regarded Taiwan as a renegade province, a relic left over from its long civil war and the century of humiliation it climaxed. This was the period between 1839 and 1949, where China repeatedly found itself invaded, defeated, occupied and partitioned by foreign powers. Taiwan's self-governing status is a reminder to the Chinese leadership of those times, and reunifying it with the mainland is one of the most important objectives for China's authoritarian leader, Xi Jinping, who hopes that the process will be completed by 2049, the centennial of the Chinese Communist Party's ascendancy to power. There are many obstacles to this plan, but one of them is not so often cited – the Philippines. Let's take a look at the Philippines, its tense relationship with China, and how this nation threatens Beijing's grandest foreign policy ambition. Taiwan is important to the Chinese leadership not just for historical reasons, but because of its economic and geostrategic position. Economically, Taiwan hosts the world's most advanced semiconductor industry through the dominance of one company the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company TSMC. In 2021, Taiwan had 63% of the world's semiconductor market share, with 54% of the world total being through TSMC alone. These chips are at the heart of the world's digital economy and power everything from computers to the brake sensors in cars. For China, gaining control of this industry would be very desirable. Placing itself at the heart of the globe's high-technology supply chain has been a major priority for its geopolitical strategy, as seen in its Made in China 2025 plan. If the semiconductor shortage of the past few years made things more expensive, Beijing getting to dictate the supply chain of these vital components would increase the price tag of almost everything much further. Geopolitically, Taiwan also sits at the center of the first island chain, the series of islands that span from Japan to Indonesia. These islands act as a natural obstacle to China's expansion into the Pacific and Indian Oceans. Restoring Taiwan to Beijing's rule would break this chain and allow China to freely access the world's oceans without having to go through the choke points that the first island chain presents, such as the Strait of Malacca or the Miyako Strait. Controlling these choke points is one of the United States Navy's principal strategies for containing Chinese military expansion. If China were to take Taiwan, however, it would have the land and ports it needs to bypass those choke points, making containment much more difficult, if not impossible. The United States is Taiwan's most important potential ally. Officially, America treats Taiwan with a doctrine of strategic ambiguity, neither confirming nor denying that it would come to the island's defense if it were to be invaded, but under the Taiwan Relations Act of 1979, it has long sold sophisticated weapons to the island nation to deter such an invasion from happening. With this equipment, Taiwan has pursued what it calls a porcupine strategy, fortifying itself as heavily as possible and building offensive assets to deal damage to the Chinese mainland, all to increase the costs China would incur for an invasion and hold out as long as it can while it awaits the aid of its allies. Japan would also play an important role in the defense of Taiwan. In December 2021, the late former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe said the United States and Japan would not be able to stand idly by if Taiwan were attacked. In 2022, only a few months before his shocking assassination, he urged the United States to drop strategic ambiguity and affirmatively say it would defend Taiwan. A Taiwan contingency is a Japan contingency, he said. 
because China establishing air superiority around Taiwan would cover Japanese airspace. A takeover of Taiwan would also allow China to threaten Japanese shipping even more than it does today with its militarization of the South China Sea. Japan is a resource-poor nation and must import raw materials and commodities to survive. It cannot allow China to dictate what goes on in the region's shipping lanes. However, for all the talk about Japan and its role in a potential Chinese invasion of Taiwan, far fewer people talk about the role the Philippines would play in such a scenario. Thanks to a renewed agreement with the United States, this is starting to change, and Taiwan may soon be able to count on the aid of the Philippines as it stares down the Colossus across the strait. The Philippines, though much smaller than the United States and Japan, also has a keen interest in seeing that Taiwan does not become subject to the Chinese Communist Party, and the Philippines has now become a major player in the dispute over Taiwan. The entrance of the Philippines into the Taiwan question is a natural consequence of the diplomatic and military rivalry between it and China, which has occurred in the last decade. The Philippines and China have long had a bitter dispute over the waters of the South China Sea. In 2012, China seized control of the Scarborough Shoal, a rock with valuable fishing sites and hydrocarbon reserves that rests within the Philippines' exclusive economic zone. It was the start of a conflict between China and the Philippines over several rocks and island chains in the South China Sea. Other points of contention between the two nations include Mischief Reef and the Spratly Islands, all of which China went on to occupy and fortify. The Philippines brought a suit in international court, and in 2016, a tribunal in The Hague ruled that all of China's territorial claims in the South China Sea, based on a nine-dash line map drawn in the late 1940s, had no legal basis. Still, China ignored the ruling and occupies these rocks and islands to this day. China's aggressive policy in the area has naturally alienated the Philippines, which is a longtime ally of the United States. The United States has had bases throughout the Philippines since the Spanish-American War of 1898, but its presence is now starting to expand much more. The Filipino military is not a formidable fighting force, meaning that China has mostly been able to get its way in its disputes with the Philippines, despite the international tribunals ruling against it. The Philippines has an active army of about 100,000 active duty personnel, a navy with only a few vessels more fit for fighting than patrol boats, and about 25 combat aircraft. This means that militarily, the Philippines would contribute little to the defense of Taiwan, at least for now. However, the Philippines does have two advantages its geographical position and its alliance with the United States, which it has now began to ramp up ties with again after a period of frostier relations. In 2014, as the South China Sea dispute began to ramp up, the United States and the Philippines signed the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement EDCA. Under the terms of the EDCA, the United States would be able to expand its military presence in the Philippines, although the 2014 document did not specifically state where it would do this. Rather, the document only affirmed the principle that the armed forces of the Philippines would provide new locations for the United States armed forces. In 2016, five such locations were formally announced. These were, from north to south, Fort Magsaysay in Nueva Ecija, Basa Air Base in Pampanga, Mactan Benito Ebuen Air Base in Kebu, Antonio Bautista Air Base, and Lumbia Air Base in Cagayan de Oro. Of the 2016 locations, Antonio Batista Air Base was the most important, as it was close to the disputed Spratly Islands in the South China Sea. However, as China's military buildup in the region has only grown since 2016, the United States and Philippines announced plans to further accelerate the EDCA in February 2023. In April, the Pentagon announced the creation of four new EDCA bases. These are Naval Base Camilo Osias in Santa Ana, Cagayan, Camp Melchor de la Cruz in Gamu, Isabella, Balabac Island in Palawan, and Lalo Airport in Cagayan. Not coincidentally, three of these four locations are in the northern Philippines, which makes the intentions of that expansion clear. The new bases are to help deter a potential invasion of Taiwan by allowing the United States to more easily project power into a critical area, the Luzon Strait. The Luzon Strait is one of the first island chain's strategic choke points. It is a 160-mile gap of water between the Philippines and Taiwan. The Philippines' northernmost island, Mavulis, is even closer, at only 118 miles away from the world's most disputed hotspot. Here is where we see the role that the Philippines would play in the defense of the world's most hotly contested island. In the first place, the bases give the United States and its regional allies additional options to choke off shipping to China. 
As China is heavily dependent on foreign food and energy imports, this is something that the country's leadership will need to take seriously and helps aid the process of deterrence. Geographically, the bases strengthen a potential new front to counter a Chinese invasion of Taiwan if deterrence fails and hostilities actually become a reality. In the necessary amphibious operation, China would now likely be facing a pincer movement of forces moving south from Japan and north from the Philippines, adding to the already immense difficulty of pulling off a successful waterborne maneuver and establishing a beachhead across the Strait of Taiwan. An amphibious invasion is hard enough. An amphibious invasion that would need to fend off American and Allied forces on two sides, that would be almost impossible, especially with a lack of surprise on the invaders' side. The bases also better prepare the United States and its other allies in the region, such as its quad partners Japan and Australia, for war. Their locations make them ideal places to stage military exercises simulating an invasion of Taiwan. Although there is no true substitute for actual combat operations, the better prepared military force will usually get the better of an engagement, something the Chinese brass should know well, since the principle goes all the way back to Sun Tzu. The new bases in the Philippines certainly increase the preparation the United States and its allies can make for a coming invasion. The renewed military partnership between the United States and the Philippines also offers the prospect of improving that country's military readiness as well, which as we have seen is badly needed. As China's policy in the region has routinely seen the Philippines bullied, it is likely that policymakers in Manila will want to take advantage of the opportunity that the new bases provide. Indeed, the United States and the Philippines have already conducted drills in the Luzon Strait, which will lead to improved Filipino readiness in the long run. Someday soon, the Philippines could join joint exercises not only with the United States, but with its partners in the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, Japan, Australia, and possibly even India. The new bases in the Philippines also helped to reduce one of China's major advantages, which had been eroding the United States' share of the military balance of power in the Indo-Pacific region. Namely, the bases helped to mitigate the tyranny of distance. This term describes the disadvantage the United States would face by fighting thousands of miles away from its homeland. It would need to ship troops, supplies, and other essentials over those thousands of miles of ocean, where China's troops and supplies would only need to travel a little bit from their homeland. The vast distance also has a negative effect on morale at the home front, because it makes Americans wonder what the war is really about. This was a big factor in contributing to the political controversies in America's interventions in Vietnam and Iraq. And it is a tradition that goes back to the earliest days of the country's history. With China's development of anti-access area denial A2AD, capabilities, the tyranny of distance has magnified. The long American supply lines would make ripe targets for China's A2AD strategy. But the bases in the Philippines give the United States more options. It can now position many more assets close to the area where the fighting over Taiwan would be taking place, making China's A2AD harder to carry out. For example, China has an arsenal of thousands of ballistic missiles that threatens all of America's bases in the region. But the more targets there are to hit, and the more air defense systems get concentrated along the bases, the faster China's missile depletion becomes. Some of the missiles will hit, but the bases in the Philippines mean that now China has more targets to hit and more air defense systems to deal with. The bases in the Philippines ultimately mean the attrition math will shift more in favor of the United States and its allies, even though they would still take terrible damage in an all-out Chinese missile attack. Still, surviving assets can more confidently be brought forward to act when the reign of missiles ends. In this way, the new bases in the Philippines are in line with the United States' third offset strategy, which it codified in the mid-2010s. Meanwhile, the new base means that the United States will be able to position more assets that can hit the Chinese mainland too, further undermining China's A2AD strategy and increasing the costs of a conflict exponentially and further aiding deterrence. The agreement with the Philippines, however, prohibits the deployment of nuclear weapons in the bases, so the EDCA is not a nuclear umbrella type of agreement. That is one of the few items of solace for the Chinese leadership. For the Philippines, the renewal and expansion of the EDCA marks a return to its traditional close relationship with the United States. Despite the territorial disputes in the South China Sea, Rodrigo Duterte, president of the Philippines from 2016 to 2022, flirted with forging closer relations with China in order to reduce the country's dependence on the United States. His successor, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., 
has proven more traditional in pursuing the Philippines' alliance with the United States. The new base also includes an investment worth over $82 million for infrastructure and access to resources for those bases. This investment will be a good source of jobs for local Filipino residents, meaning that they aid the United States not only in its projection of military power, but economic influence. Therefore, aside from the military balance of power in the Indo-Pacific region, the bases also affect one of the cornerstones of Chinese policy, economic coercion. China has long used its financial and industrial power to exert leverage over the domestic politics of other nations. We have even witnessed this in action in the United States, with certain Hollywood filmmakers carefully curating their content to not offend Chinese sensibilities, and the 2019 controversy in the NBA about the fate of Hong Kong, which was erupting with protests at the time. The effects are far more profound elsewhere. For example, China has used its economic leverage over many Muslim-majority nations to buy their silence regarding the treatment of its Muslim Uyghur population in its western Xinjiang province, which the United States State Department, the British Parliament, and several other governments around the world have formally classified as genocide. China's infrastructure investments through its Belt and Road Initiative, among other projects, have also given it leverage over countries receiving the funds. Although the Philippines is technically a member of the Belt and Road Initiative, its Chinese-sponsored infrastructure development there has only been limited and is highly controversial among the Filipino public. Despite China's attempts to make inroads, the United States and its respective companies remain the heaviest source of foreign investment in the Philippines. The situation has limited the Chinese government's ability to exert economic coercion over that country. In the past, Xi Jinping and the Chinese leadership could have hoped to buy at least the neutrality of the Philippines concerning the Taiwan issue, but with the new bases and both the military and economic ties that it brings with the United States, this possibility just got sharply reduced. The failure of China to bring the Philippines into its orbit, despite the six years of friendly Duterte presidency, severely threatens Beijing's plans for Taiwan. Geographically, the Philippines is just too important to the success or failure of an operation to take the island, the Philippines now actively coming onto the side of the United States makes the already difficult operation even more difficult for China, and the problem is only likely to get worse for Beijing. Unlike China, the Philippines is increasing in population. It is expected to increase from the current 117 million to about 180 million by the end of the century. Meanwhile, China's population peaked in about 2020 and is now declining. It is expected to shrink from 1.4 billion to about 776 million by the end of the century. The Philippines' economy is growing as well, with an average annual GDP growth of 6.4% since 1990. As the Philippines' population economy grows, it will be an even better source for American investment, and the new wealth will give the Philippines the opportunity to expand its military power in the future. Add this reality to China's economic and demographic problems, and the window for the mainland to reunify with the island through use of force might be closing rapidly. Unsurprisingly, the Chinese government was not happy about the renewal of the EDCA and the expansion of American military bases and financial investment in the Philippines. When the news came, the Chinese foreign ministry accused the United States and Philippines of increasing tension in the region and helping to destabilize it. For the Philippines, though, there is little choice but to strengthen its ties with the United States. As another country in the first island chain, it would be even more subjected to China's whims if it took control of Taiwan. Just like Japan, its airspace would be under threat if China controlled the skies over Taiwan. Its shipping and maritime commerce, already under stress from China's occupation of strategic real estate in the South China Sea, would be that much more inhibited. When seen in this light, it was probably foolish for the Chinese leadership to believe that the Philippines would ever come under its orbit to the extent that countries in the Eurasian interior would. In the affairs of nations, security considerations will almost always win out over economic considerations. Because of its geopolitical position, the Philippines cannot let China secure a hegemonic position in the Indo-Pacific region, which it would do if Taiwan were to fall. Therefore, it is in the interest of the Philippines to forge ties with and host the military of the only nation that can prevent such a thing from happening, the United States. China may have thought time was on its side, but the renewal of the EDCA might just mean that by 2049, China will be unable to attempt an invasion of Taiwan, let alone actually succeed in its plan. But what do you think? Do the new American bases in the Philippines shift the region's balance of power and threaten China's plans to invade Taiwan? If so, how heavily? Let us know in the comments. 
Also, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. The Korean War never ended. No treaty has ever been signed, and the ongoing armistice of 1953 holds only a tenuous peace, and finding a lasting peace might just be the toughest nut to crack in all of international relations, because too many interests intersect on an all too heavily armed peninsula. Indeed, the Korean stalemate doesn't look like it will end anytime soon, if ever. That's the best realistic scenario, because if the stalemate somehow ends and war breaks out again, American and South Korean leaders face a daunting problem. North Korea is almost impossible to invade. Here's why. First of all, invading North Korea would be a game that involves playing with nuclear fire, because the country now has enough fissile material for an estimated 20 to 60 warheads, according to the Congressional Research Service. The North Koreans have the means of delivering those payloads onto targets all over the world, too. North Korea now has a diverse array of ballistic missiles in its arsenal. In late March 2023, the North Koreans purportedly successfully tested the Hwaesong-17 ICBM. The object reached an altitude of about 3,850 miles over a 684-mile arc. If this object were to fly on a traditional ballistic missile arc, it would have a range of over 9,320 miles, making it capable of hitting any target in the continental United States. The Hwaesong-17 may potentially be able to carry more than one warhead too. North Korea also has the 6,460-mile Hwaesong-14 and 877-mile Hwaesong-15, giving it the ability to reach most targets in the United States, even if the Hwaesong-17 doesn't work. It is still controversial. And there lies the first problem in invading North Korea. In the past, strategic retaliation by the North Koreans would have been impossible. Now, they can deliver at least several city-busting nuclear warheads with yields of up to 140 kilotons, which are seven times more powerful than the atomic bombs dropped on Japan at the end of World War II. Any invasion of North Korea would now almost certainly prompt a nuclear response from the Kim regime. It could be directed at the American homeland, against bases in Japan or Guam or elsewhere. With nuclear deterrence now in place, an invasion of North Korea is pretty much out of the question. However, even without nuclear weapons, North Korea possesses another form of deterrence. The country has about 6,000 conventional artillery systems aimed directly at Seoul, the South Korean capital. Should the North Koreans choose to unleash a full-scale bombardment on Seoul, the RAND Corporation estimates that 200,000 people could die in the first hour alone. An invasion of North Korea would need to rapidly neutralize these artillery systems at targets all along the border to prevent civilian casualties the likes of which the modern world has never seen. Although American and South Korean intelligence undoubtedly knows where some of these systems are positioned, it's impossible to take all of them out in time to prevent significant loss of civilian life. North Korea has another ace up its sleeve when it comes to making invasion impossible, its alliance with the Chinese Communist Party. The North Korean regime depends on China's support for its continued existence. It is through trade with China that North Korea can get around the otherwise crippling economic sanctions imposed on the so-called Hermit Kingdom by the rest of the world. Without Chinese imports, North Korea would quickly descend into anarchy, as it would lack food, energy, and other essentials. However, the relationship between the two countries hasn't always been on the best of terms. Even so, the North has significant leverage over China, despite its economic disadvantage. China is not always enamored with the North Korean regime, but it needs the Kims to stay in power for two reasons. First, North Korea is one of China's only allies on the Pacific Basin. Eastward, from Japan to Indonesia, is a string of American allies or nations friendly to the United States. Geopolitical observers call this area the First Island Chain. This string of islands effectively cuts China off from the Pacific and Indian Oceans and threatens Chinese shipping. Having North Korea as a projection onto the sea helps China to prevent complete encirclement and to keep American or American-aligned military forces off its land border. The possibility of American soldiers being stationed on that land border was the reason China intervened in the Korean War in the first place. The second reason that China has a keen interest in keeping the Kims in power is because if North Korea were to become destabilized, it would be dealing with millions of refugees flooding its border and causing chaos in the Chinese homeland. These are two unacceptable scenarios for Beijing, and as a result, any invasion scenario that involves North Korea will almost certainly see China get involved, just like it did in the Korean War. 
For all these reasons, the Kim regime rightly feels secure in its power over its hermit kingdom. The costs of mounting an invasion are simply too high in any realistic scenario. But what if, in a hypothetical scenario, it was necessary for the United States to lead another international coalition in a war on the Korean peninsula? Would it even be possible to invade North Korea? Any land assault would be harrowing. To mount a northward offensive, Allied forces would first need to pass through the Demilitarized Zone, or DMZ, at the border, the only available land route to invade the country. The Korean DMZ is the most heavily fortified piece of land in the world. Millions of landmines span its 160-mile width. In addition to the mines, the North has built an electrified fence and countless watchtowers would make excellent sniping outposts and machine gun nests. Although these would be spotted and taken out by artillery or air power, they would nevertheless slow the Allied advance and cause significant casualties in the opening hours of the war. And then there are North Korean assets that aren't as easy to deal with. Intelligence has estimated that there are at least 800 fortified bunkers near the DMZ, with each one capable of sheltering between 1,500 and 2,000 soldiers. These would serve as excellent rallying points, and although they too would eventually be destroyed, doing so would take a long time and would give the North Koreans room to create more casualties and chaos. North Korea also has a large army, one of the largest armies in the world at about 1.2 million personnel as of 2020 and about 70% of its army is within 50 miles of the DMZ. 50% of its naval and air forces are within the same range. Not all of the people stationed at or near the DMZ are combat troops, but the North still boasts a huge amount of armed soldiers and platforms within a short and narrow range to concentrate firepower on any enemy invasion force. North Korea has also now created a formidable short and intermediate range ballistic missile force, which it will bring to bear in the event of an invasion. Several of its missiles can reach ranges between 930 and 2,795 miles. Even if the North Koreans decide to use only conventional payloads, these missiles can do serious damage to American bases in the region from Japan all the way to Guam. North Korea has already displayed enough ballistic missiles in its military parades alone to potentially overwhelm American missile defense systems like the THAAD. While estimates of the North's total number of ballistic missiles are hard to come by, there are more than enough to cause significant damage to American bases throughout the Pacific. Even if the attacks do not escalate to the nuclear level, these ballistic missiles would not only potentially wreak havoc on American and Allied forces on the Korean Peninsula, but threaten their supply lines coming from Japan and elsewhere. North Korea also likely has, or is developing, tactical nuclear weapons that do not rise to the level of city-destroying yields, but would cause mass casualties against enemy forces on a battlefield. The North would certainly use them against an invasion force. There is also no guarantee that an attack across the DMZ would ensure that the North Koreans remain on the defensive. Between 1974 and 2000, the South Korean army found and sealed four North Korean tunnels that crossed the DMZ and stretched into the South's territory. There are likely more that have not been found. Although attacks through such channels would not by themselves halt an invasion of North Korea, they have the potential to cause significant chaos in the rear ranks of American, South Korean, and other Allied forces, further stressing supply lines. In fact, North Korea has long had plans for an offensive into the South, should another war on the peninsula break out. This one-blow non-stop attack would likely use chemical weapons in addition to conventional firepower. Kim Jong-il, North Korea's previous dictator, declared in 1992 that a lightning offensive across the DMZ would be able to break all the way to Pusan in three days, in spite of the concentration of American and South Korean firepower and manpower along the border. While this declaration was typical of North Korean boasting and would be unlikely to succeed in its grand design, the point to take seriously is that the North Koreans have enough manpower and firepower of their own to attack toward the South and potentially would need to be taken seriously in an invasion scenario. The use of tactical nuclear weapons, which the North did not possess when Kim Jong-il made this statement in 1992, would increase the threat. Bypassing the hellish DMZ and attempting an amphibious and airborne assault behind it would theoretically be an option especially because the United States Navy, assisted by the South Koreans, would quickly establish sea and air supremacy. If there is one saving grace in a war scenario with North Korea, it is that the North's air force is weak. Many of its planes are 1950s-era fighters like the MiG-17, 19, and 21, 
North Korea even still uses a hefty amount of propeller-driven planes. The best fighters in its fleet are the third-generation MiG-23 and fourth-generation MiG-29 and Su-25, but North Korea probably only has a couple of dozen of these in working order. Because of the technology gap, North Korea's air force would be overwhelmed, and it would only be a matter of time before the American, South Korean and Allied air forces established air superiority. However, what the North Koreans lack in quality, they make up for in quantity. The North Koreans have hundreds of planes and only need to patrol a limited airspace. These planes could harass and delay the invasion, increasing the costs even as the North Korean Air Force inevitably gets decimated in the process upon encountering hostile aircraft and modern air defense systems. However, North Korea's aircraft would not be the only threat to Allied planes. North Korea has been testing surface-to-air missiles as fervently as it has tested ballistic missiles. First, there is the KN-06, a medium-range system similar to Russia's S-300. A longer-range system closer to Russia's S-400 was also tested in September 2021. These systems and North Korea's liberal amount of anti-aircraft artillery units would create significant casualties even against modern aircraft. If North Korea lacks a modern air force, it can make up for it to a certain extent with a far more modern air defense system. And North Korea's ballistic missiles potentially carrying tactical nuclear warheads, those would pose a big problem for an amphibious assault scenario. The North Korean army, the KPA, may be far less formidable than it appears on the parade grounds. Its soldiers are often not in top condition. One famous escapee in 2017, Oh Chong Song, had several large parasitic worms in his stomach. Disease and malnutrition are common among the Korean People's Army ranks. However, there are so many soldiers that they would still cause extremely heavy casualties. Meanwhile, the North Korean Air Force and Navy may be hopelessly out of date, but there are enough numbers and firepower to make any invasion of such a heavily fortified country a nightmare scenario even for a highly motivated attacker. On their own, the North Koreans would most likely lose a war on the peninsula against South Korea and the United States but the price of victory would easily be combined military and civilian deaths in the millions. And that's not even mentioning the fact that North Korea would not be acting alone. So far in our actual invasion scenario, we have not talked about the force that China could and would use to multiply North Korea's advantages. Because as we said in the start of this video, no Korean War II scenario would pass by without China getting involved in some way. China's People's Liberation Army, the PLA troops, are unlikely to be in worse shape than their North Korean counterparts and would add a hefty amount of manpower to the already dense defenses in the North's territory. China's PLA is the world's largest army with almost 2.2 million soldiers on active duty, and China would have the luxury of being able to concentrate most of these forces in the Korean theater, while the United States' worldwide military commitments would make America less able to do so. The prospect of further Russian aggression in Eastern Europe would alone make concentration in Korea a more difficult prospect to accomplish. China's Air Force has more modern planes than North Korea's, including the fifth-generation Chengdu J-20, and would make establishing air superiority more difficult. Additionally, China has thousands of intermediate-range ballistic missiles as part of its anti-access area denial strategy. China would almost certainly use some of its stockpile to attack American bases in Japan, Guam, and elsewhere in the region, adding even more to the bombardment their North Korean allies can already launch. And the closer you are to the Chinese mainland, the more accurate the missiles get, which would make an amphibious assault on North Korea from the west, such as that seen at Incheon in the Korean War, an almost impossible task. Ensuring even further concentration of North Korean and Chinese forces along the DMZ and the Sea of Japan. The Chinese missile threat would also make the supply situation already tricky even more difficult. With the likely destruction of Seoul, the use of weapons of mass destruction, and the risk of escalation into a general war between the United States and China, we should be thankful that the stalemate on the Korean Peninsula continues. The North Korean regime is an affront to all of humanity, but unfortunately, the Kims have successfully entrenched themselves into an almost unassailable position where stalemate is the least bad among a litany of bad options, all of which make North Korea practically impossible to invade. But what do you think? Is North Korea really impenetrable, or is there a way it could successfully be invaded? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. What do Ukraine and China have in common? Let's start with geopolitical significance. Both China and Ukraine hold strategic geopolitical importance. 
China is the world's most populous country, with a population of approximately 1,426,000,000 in 2023, and the second largest economy, preceded by the US. Ukraine, on the other hand, is the second largest country in Europe by land area, with a total area of approximately 232,900 square miles. This means that the second largest country in Europe is roughly 28 times smaller than Europe's largest country, Russia, which spans an area of roughly 6,606,000 square miles. Then there's the fact that both China and Ukraine are connected through China's Belt and Road Initiative, or BRI, making Ukraine an important transit country for the BRI's land-based routes and thus linking China with Europe. However, lately, a new and deeply disturbing commonality has arisen between both countries, Putin's war on Ukraine. And as bad as it's been for Ukraine itself, it has also been downright disastrous for China. But why? In what way? Let's find out. In today's world, it pays to have friends in high places. Fortunately for the Western world, and especially Ukraine, Russia has virtually none of them. China, however, is among the few. The two neighbor nations are strategic partners, linked economically by $190 billion of annual trade, and politically by virtue of their authoritarian, like-minded leaders. Over the past decades, the two countries have forged closer bilateral ties. Both sides, moreover, view the United States as a hostile actor bent on containing their territorial and cultural ambitions. On the surface, they're like two geopolitical peas in a pod. But all is not as rosy as it seems. Once aspirational partners of Western democracies content, even keen to assimilate these two Eurasian powers into their economic, cultural, and political spheres, Putin's invasion of Ukraine has changed everything. Russia's once vaunted military has, in many circles, become a laughingstock. And this has reflected poorly on China, whose own extraterritorial designs on its neighbors are well known throughout the world. Most peace-loving nations today view both as a threat, though certainly not on equal levels. One US official perhaps summarized it best, Russia is a hurricane. It comes on hard and fast. China, on the other hand, is climate change. Long, slow, pervasive. Today, China continues to foster close relations with Putin, even though the Russian president headlines the International Criminal Court's arrest warrant list. It's a bad look. But the PRC isn't willing to throw the Kremlin out with the bathwater just yet. Today, we'll discuss why they might want to reconsider that decision, and just how Russia's reverses in Ukraine may influence China's strategic calculus moving forward. Putin's illegal war has been an eye-opening experience for the world. China, as we all know, harbors territorial claims on Taiwan, its independent island neighbor. As such, the United States, Taiwan, and the vast majority of the civilized world place China's ambitions in the same category as Putin's toward Ukraine. Ever since Russian forces stormed across the border in February 2022, the United States and its allies kept a closer eye on China. If the Ukrainian invasion went as well as many thought it would, it would be fair to assume China might feel empowered to attack Taiwan, especially as Europe and the US were distracted by Russia. We can safely say now, over a year in, and knowing what he knows about the complexities of modern joint and combined arms warfare, Xi would have to be stupid to authorize an unprovoked amphibious invasion of Taiwan. So far, there's only one dictator dumb enough to do that, and look how that's going. With each passing day, the PRC is witnessing Russia sink unfathomable amounts of blood and treasure into an almost unwinnable war of attrition. In the wreckage of Bakhmut, the atrocities of Bukha, and the discontent growing in the hearts of babushkas far and wide, China's leadership sees its future plans of easily seizing Taiwan slipping away. War is a hard teacher. For now, China may be content to sit back and learn all it can, while it can. Why then has Putin's invasion become a disaster for China's future plans? Let's dive in. No matter how you cut it, almost every lesson in Ukraine spells bad news for China. So far, China has adopted a unique, long-term, over-the-horizon strategic approach in its posture towards Taiwan. Its primary tactic has not been as in-your-face as you would expect from a rising superpower accustomed to throwing its economic and cultural weight around. 
But militarily, China has adapted something called grey zone operations to achieve its strategic ends. Grey zone operations are just like they sound, actions on the spectrum between peace and war. These small, compounding confrontations are not designed to escalate into a full-scale war, but they certainly can. They tend to be employed by powerful actors bent on achieving objectives that ordinarily might be illegal or too difficult to do all at once, and often take a variety of forms. These can include cyber attacks or covert espionage, political propaganda and misinformation campaigns, election rigging, economic warfare and sanctions, proxy wars, and the funding of destabilizing insurgencies, or the gradual weakening of alliances and partnerships. One of China's preferred tactics is to slowly increase the number of times it flies into Taiwan's air defense identification zone, the internationally recognized airspace around the island, until it almost becomes normal. Along with this, China has recently sent more and more vessels up to and even over the Taiwan Strait median line, demarcating the boundary between both countries. It has deployed men and material onto smaller island chains, man-made and otherwise, in the South China Sea to intimidate and pressure their neighbor. It harasses foreign vessels traversing these waters too, as a Chinese naval vessel recently did to a Philippine Coast Guard patrol, just 105 miles off its own coastline. Grey zone operations take place independent from one another, on different days, at different times, just infrequently enough for the world to forget about them in our 24-hour news cycle. It's pretty smart. If China did everything at once, the world would label it as even more of a belligerent and untrustworthy actor than it already does. Collectively, these acts normalize displays of Chinese power, chip away at Taiwan's defensive resolve, condition the West into accepting higher levels of belligerency, and set China up for its ultimate aim. For anyone paying attention, the world has seen this type of behavior before. Vladimir Putin utilized grey zone tactics prior to and during its first invasion of Ukraine in 2014, dispatching mercenaries and Russian forces in anonymous green uniforms with no markings to do his bidding, destabilizing the local government and paving the way for Russia's annexation of Crimea. Putin told everyone he had no idea who these little green men were, as if. Their disguise as local pro-Russian separatists enabled Putin to claim plausible deniability for their involvement, giving him the ability to achieve his geopolitical aim without officially escalating the crisis into an unwinnable war. That didn't last long. Despite the Kremlin's reliance on grey zone operations, it ultimately could not get everything it wanted without a bigger pre-planned invasion. And here, China will have certainly taken note. Before 2022, the West could only respond to what seemed a measured, limited invasion with measured, limited sanctions. China can and does expect the same when it pulls similar stunts in the South China Sea. The United States, as yet, hasn't been able to do much to challenge China's construction of artificial islands or its repeated violation of Taiwanese airspace since it is short of a pronounced, conventional invasion. China can harass and weaken Taiwan in limited ways and still not be seen as overt aggressors. The West can apply economic, political and diplomatic pressure, but China has weathered this type of response for decades now. Russia's switch from grey zone tactics to full-blown warfare has given China insight into the West's response, and it probably doesn't like what it has seen. The world rallied behind Ukraine, pouring billions of dollars worth of arms and aid into the fight. Its alliances grew stronger, its commitment to defending vulnerable nations, even indirectly more firm, China now knows what it can expect in a similar Taiwan contingency. If they had plans to invade in the near future, they have probably shelved them for now, and rightly so. Just another reason why Putin's war has not only benefited the West, but also deterred China in the East. There are other lessons to be taken from Russia's invasion. Chief among them, China has learned that size isn't everything. China's military is excellent on paper, it has 2 million active soldiers, half a million more than the US. It recently launched its third aircraft carrier, which, compared to anyone besides the US, is a decent number, and now boasts the largest navy in the world by pure numbers. Its defense budget is surpassed only by the US. It has some of the world's best air-to-air -air hypersonic missiles and attack drones. But China sees that Russia, too, once boasted similar stats. From Ukraine, China has learned that material and numerical superiority doesn't automatically translate to victory. 
if it wants to successfully invade Taiwan, it will need far, far more. Russia had by far the more achievable territorial ambitions when it invaded Ukraine compared to China's designs on Taiwan. It had amassed so many tanks and mechanized infantry on Ukraine's border, it was easy to assume, and most did, that Kyiv would quickly capitulate. The countries are right next to each other. Russia had excellent railway access into the country. Save a few key waterways, Ukraine lacks natural defensive features. Russia even had a friendly partner in Belarus, whose territory it used to stage its attack. China would have to surmount a logistical Mount Everest if it commits to a similar invasion plan in Taiwan. Amphibious operations are among the most difficult to pull off, combining the intricacies of air, land and sea warfare and the logistical challenge of transporting vehicles, men and weapons across open water to contested shores. China has to cross the 100-mile-wide Strait of Taiwan first and foremost, a span in which it will be vulnerable to barrages of artillery and anti-ship missiles. If the fate of the Moskva, the flagship of the Russian Black Sea Fleet, is any indication, modern anti-ship missiles can in fact exercise a massively disproportionate influence over the battlefield. When it gets onto the island of Taiwan, assuming it can actually establish a beachhead, it will have to establish and sustain huge stockpiles of supplies shipped over in secure convoys, defend itself from what will undoubtedly be an onslaught of Taiwanese artillery, and withstand any counterattacks that come. Superior numbers may not be enough to win out. Ultimately, the outcome of Russia's invasion is bad news for China for this one simple reason. You cannot intimidate your way to victory in war, especially when the enemy you fight has the moral high ground. Resistance will be fierce and pronounced. Taiwan will not give up simply because China outnumbers them. China has learned other lessons from Ukraine, among them the importance of training in the outcome of military engagements. Just as material superiority won't automatically translate to victory, armies will always struggle to overcome deficiencies in training. It is an indisputable fact that Ukrainian troops are far better trained than their Russian counterparts, mercenary conscript or otherwise. Most of Russia's most experienced, best-trained troops, commanders and non-commissioned officers are now dead, and Putin's repeated mobilization efforts have starkly revealed the deficiencies in Russian military training, whether the alarming lack of weapons, vehicles and live ammunition to train on, unsuitable training sites, poor leadership, a chronic lack of technological enablers, or concern for the general well-being and training up of cohesive collective units. On the other hand, Ukraine has integrated a vast spectrum of foreign munitions, weapons, drones and technology, eschewing older Soviet models and tactics for more effective Western ones. And that, in tandem with the intelligence they receive on a daily basis, has helped deliver several stunning victories. But while we often talk about the technology behind Ukraine's success, it's certainly no silver bullet. Western weapons are hard to maintain, at least in Ukraine, being both subject to breakdown and difficult to replace when stocks run low. In this discussion, we tend to forget the human element, how hard it is to deploy and use modern weapons effectively. Among other things, Ukrainian troops are road testing real-time online information and networking systems, drone jamming guns, and maritime remote-controlled kamikaze boats, Western systems that take a real know-how and expertise to operate within a combined arms setting. They are improving their intelligence and surveillance gathering efforts. They are becoming experts at psychological warfare, joint operations, and sustainment logistics. It's been a whirlwind crash course, to say the least. But they have not worked alone. As far back as 2014, Ukrainian officers were receiving Western training, especially from the United States, Great Britain, Canada, and other European nations. As early as 1993, Ukrainian armed forces were training in the US through the United States National Guard's State Partnership Program. Learning to deliver mission-type orders, empower Ukrainian soldiers to make on-the-fly battlefield decisions, and using realistic combat exercises to hone the skills and wartime resilience of Ukrainian personnel. More recently, tens of thousands of Ukrainian officers have received crash courses in modern joint war fighting in Britain, Germany, Poland, and as part of the US Army Europe's Joint Multinational Training Group Ukraine, a blended task force of Americans, Poles, Lithuanians, Brits, Canadians, and other soldiers established in 2015 
to mentor and advise Ukrainian battalions in the art of combined arms warfare. These train-the-trainer programs, arguably more than the weapons and munitions themselves, are conferring Ukraine a distinct battlefield advantage. The bad news for China is that Taiwan joined a similar US-led program in 2022 and have been integrating Western-built weapons systems far longer than that. Every day that goes by, their military will glean lessons from the best forces in the world, making an invasion that much harder to pull off. Speaking of lessons, it is a well-known fact that Russia underestimated the extent to which Ukraine would receive Western assistance after it was invaded, and China now knows that even if the United States, its allies and partners do not expressly commit hard military power to fight side by side with Taiwanese forces in the event of an invasion, it can be sure that the likelihood the Western world will assist Taiwan in some way is extremely high. Geographic distance from an international hotspot no longer hinders the degree of foreign aid or the level of intervention in the way it once did. Even though a vast Pacific expanse separates Taiwan from the United States, it would still send crucial military and humanitarian aid if China invades. Witnessing the astronomical sums of money donated by NATO member countries to Ukraine will send shivers down Xi Jinping's spine. Thanks to Russia, the West is once more alert to the tangible threat of authoritarianism. Gone are the days of ambivalence or neutrality when it comes to ensuring territorial integrity. China's hopes of the United States staying aloof from a Taiwanese confrontation are long gone. The US has proven willing to send state-of-the-art tanks, high-tech weapons, and advisors to help Ukraine, currently facing its second most pronounced national security threat. We predict it will offer the same assistance, if not more, to Taiwan. This leads to another reason why Russia's experience should send warning signals to China. Just as it has drawn insight from the West's reaction to Russia's invasion, it must recognize that the West, too, has been learning what works and what doesn't when countries threaten to invade their neighbor. China may have taken some confidence from the initial response to Russia's decision to amass troops on Ukraine's border. The West could only threaten to proportionately punish Russian aggression in the vaguest terms since, technically, it was all still hypothetical. The threat and implementation of economic sanctions was serious, but far from insurmountable. Russia had hoped to win the war quickly and incorporate Ukraine's vast resources and manpower, thus shielding itself from the worst effects of sanctions. Yes, they might temporarily make average Russians uncomfortable in the short term. The long-term strategic benefits of a rapid, decisive victory, however, couldn't be ignored. Once the war was over and Russia controlled Ukraine, it's fair to say that Russia might be able to slowly reduce the impact of sanctions and re-engage in dialogue with the West, as it had after it invaded and annexed Crimea in 2014. In a perfect world, China foresees a similar outcome for its own invasion. But Russian setbacks have shown that once the war spirals out of control and the aggressor finds itself on the losing side, the West will move from mere sanctions to deterrence through denial, deploying rapid response troops to the region to prevent things from escalating further as a preventative measure. Because the threat of sanctions was not enough to stop Russia from invading, and when they were implemented they did not alter Russia's behavior to the extent many had hoped, it is possible the West will simply double down on not only arming Taiwan with the weapons and training it needs ahead of time, but redoubling its own presence. This is what Japan, Australia and other Indo-Pacific nations have already been doing for months now. You can be sure China would much rather deal with sanctions than the latter. Another takeaway is actually a corollary to the idea that the West will go beyond the threat of sanctions. It is the idea that even if sanctions are slow, they do eventually work. China is in an entirely different weight class economically than Russia. US and European officials are well aware that the potential implications of sanctions on China is a far more complex exercise than sanctions on Russia, given US and allies' extensive entanglement with the Chinese economy. At least that is according to Nazak Nikaktar, a former senior US Commerce Department official. China has the world's second largest economy and a massive global supply chain. The war would not only harm them, but the West, which relies on China for countless goods, from shoes to surfboards and cell phones to computers. But if the West is able to target specific corners of China's economy, for example its reliance on foreign-made microchips and telecommunications equipment, it could limit its ability to pursue a long-term military operation. This is what is happening to Russia, who can barely get the specialized parts and resources it needs to maintain its aging arsenal of tanks, missiles and other weapons. 
It took close to a year for Western sanctions to show results, but it is happening. It has forced Russian leadership to look to Iran, North Korea, and even China for relief. It certainly makes Chinese leaders wonder if invading Taiwan would be worth the disastrous economic consequences if it were suddenly shut off from Western goods and resources or sell its own wares in foreign markets, the bread and butter upon which it has built itself into a regional superpower. Any invasion is likely to cement sanctions in place for years, and China now has every indication that the West would be willing to sustain these for the long haul, even if it adversely affected their own economies. The invasion of Ukraine was a wake-up call to the US and the rest of NATO. For 30 years, it felt confident that the threat of authoritarianism and conventional peer aggression were relics of the past. A false sense of security lulled the West into believing it could retrench its security commitments and focus inward on themselves. In the years leading up to the war in Ukraine, there were serious, high-level discussions regarding the United States' forward presence in Europe and how far it should go to underwrite European security. It has the most powerful military on Earth. It is the backbone of NATO. If the US had to fight alone, it could certainly defeat any other country in an equal fight. But Putin's invasion reminded American policymakers how valuable multinational security collaboration can be. It highlighted the pitfalls of drawing red lines in the sand and not being willing to back them up. Now, the US and its allies are clearer about how active they will be in supporting their allies and partners. Unfortunately for China, Taiwan is one such place, and it has Putin to thank for the reaffirmation of American political, economic and military support for the island. Had Putin never invaded, it's fair to assume that the United States may have drifted into ambivalence. With each presidential term, costs of projecting preventative power into the Pacific would continue to mount, causing debate over whether it was all worth it. Who knows, over time the US may have actually withdrawn many of its forces and shuttered its overseas bases, opening a window for China's grey zone operations to come to full effect. Now, there's little chance China will get away with this type of behavior without serious repercussions. The US will keep a closer eye on China to ensure it doesn't try to mobilize an invasion force. If it does, it should take heed of one final lesson from Russia. If an invasion goes wrong, you can kiss your power and influence goodbye. Today, almost everyone across the globe besides Russia itself knows Putin's military is nowhere near as powerful as he made it out to be. Invading an independent, freedom-loving neighbor is a perfect way to turn the entire world against you. Failed invasions are tickets to infamy. They are permanent marks of discredit, disgrace, and disrepute. Russia has long since lost control of the narrative of benign liberation it touted as its primary aim. NATO has become more united and emboldened, and all from a failed invasion. If China launched its own invasion and failed, it would undoubtedly witness its hard-earned influence and prestige throughout East Asia and even beyond fade away. America's closest regional allies in the Indo-Pacific remain closely tied to China in some form or another, but if China invaded and embarked on a long, drawn-out war, it would see its regional influence shrink relative to its enemies. Just because a country is a major power does not mean the world can't live without it. Just ask Putin. Putin's invasion of Ukraine has been an unmitigated disaster for China. The powerful Eurasian alliance it once hoped to forge with its Russian ally is now severely unbalanced. The world is a completely different place than it was a year ago. Just as the West has wised up to authoritarian threats, China has learned that an invasion would be met with stout Taiwanese resistance and long-term Western support. Power on paper does not guarantee success. But what do you think? Will China decide to invade Taiwan despite the obvious risks? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Is World War III on the horizon? The answer we might not want to hear is maybe or possibly. But if a global conflict were to start now, what would it be like? Which countries would join and who would be most affected? Let's hear from our military experts. The reason the United States and other NATO countries have been hesitant to send advanced, long-range weapons to the Ukrainian military is to prevent the escalation of the conflict. They do not want to see the war escape Ukraine's borders and become a wider, greater power struggle over a much broader area, or in other words, World War III. Ukraine is not the only hotspot in the world, however. Russia's aggression, China's continued attempts to expand its power beyond its borders, and the actions of other countries in their orbit like North Korea have significantly altered the international balance of power in the last 15 years. 
great power competition has returned after the post-Cold War slumber, and with it, the flashpoints that stand at the cross-section of these competing great powers. If World War III were to break out in this decade, it would be between two sides. One would be a democratic alignment led by the United States, the other would be an authoritarian group of countries led by China and centered mostly in the interior of the Eurasian landmass. If a general conflict were to break out between the two alliances, these are the countries likeliest to become the fronts in the war, and therefore likeliest to be wrecked in the process. To begin with, we are assuming that any new war between these two alliances will not, at least at first, escalate into a nuclear exchange. Presumably, the leaders of all the countries involved would have no wish to see themselves destroyed along with the rest of human civilization. World War III would probably remain conventional, at least in its initial stages, because the leaders of the countries involved in it would want to gain something out of the hostilities. Not all countries would be equally affected by World War III either. The conflict would mostly take place in hotspots in Europe and Asia, where the two alliances intersect, very much like tectonic plates grating against one another. Ukraine was only one hotspot in the growing great power competition. All of Eastern Europe would be in danger in World War III. However, the perils of a Third World War would be particularly concentrated and devastating in the countries along the Baltic Sea. Russia has long resented the independence of the three Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, which broke away from Moscow's control following the Soviet Union's collapse. These countries joined NATO in 2004. The Kremlin would like to bring them back into its orbit and project more power into the Baltic. You can therefore bet that Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania would be a major battleground in any war between Russia and NATO, and they would be wrecked in the process. Although the Baltic states benefit from Article 5 protection under the North Atlantic Treaty, they still border Russia and would be outnumbered and outgunned in the event of war. The initial phase of the conflict would prove devastating to their armed forces as Russian troops, tanks and air power concentrates over a much narrower front than the initial invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, which saw Russian power divided along four very broad fronts, thanks to Ukraine's huge size. The Baltic countries, by contrast, are small, and the Russian invasion of them would not be divided along several fronts, but concentrated in a straight drive from Russian and Belarusian borders to the Baltic Sea. This would also relieve some of the pressure on Russian logistics, which proved so much of a problem in Ukraine. Lithuania may be the most vulnerable country of the three Baltic states, because it shares extensive borders with the heavily armed and fortified Russian outpost of Kaliningrad to its west and Belarus, Russia's closest ally in Europe to its east. In a World War III scenario, Russia would almost certainly attack in a pincer movement eastward from Kaliningrad and westward from Belarus through the Suwalki Gap, the 100-kilometer stretch of border between Poland and Lithuania that stretches between those two points. Doing so would cut the land route between the Baltic states and the rest of NATO's territory, depriving them of reinforcements and supplies over land. This move would leave Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia isolated and much more vulnerable to Russia's offensive westward to the Baltic. NATO forces might be able to eventually break through the blockade, but by the time they do, all of the Baltic states would be wrecked, with Russian troops occupying them and entrenching themselves there. The Baltic states would suffer even further damage in whatever takes place there between Russian forces and NATO reinforcements once they arrive, so even if NATO wins and manages to force all of the Russian troops in the Baltic states back to their pre-war boundaries, these countries will still turn to rubble in any World War III scenario. Another country that would certainly be wrecked in World War III is Taiwan, which is probably the world's most contentious hotspot. It sits at the center of the first island chain, the string of islands from Japan to Indonesia, which are the linchpin of the United States strategy to contain China's military expansion. Taiwan is also home to the world's most advanced semiconductor industry. There are political reasons for Taiwan's importance too. Mainland China wants to bring Taiwan back into its orbit for historical reasons, as it considers the island a rogue province left over from the civil war between the communists and nationalists. Taiwan's reintegration with mainland China is one of Xi Jinping's ultimate aims, one he wishes for the Communist Party of China to achieve by 2049, the centennial of its victory over the nationalists and its rise to power. Much of the debate about Taiwan centers on whether the Chinese military could pull off an amphibious invasion of the island, something which would be very difficult for it to do. Amphibious operations are, and always have been, one of the most complicated and difficult military maneuvers to pull off. 
To make matters worse for the Chinese, surprise scenarios like the D-Day landings at Normandy in 1944 are all but impossible in the age of satellite surveillance. Its attempt to invade the island would be known for a long time. However, this is not a panacea. Even if China is unsuccessful in its invasion operation, Taiwan would still be wrecked in the process. China has thousands of ballistic missiles in its arsenal, and even if these are not armed with nuclear warheads, conventional explosives would still be far more than enough to devastate their target country. In a World War III scenario, many of these missiles would be launched at Taiwan to strike critical assets, military bases, government offices, civilian infrastructure like power plants, strategic industrial centers, and so on. China demonstrated its ability to do this in the summer of 2022, after a visit by then United States Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. The visit led to several days of military exercises that included missiles striking the seas north, south, and east of Taiwan, with some of the missiles landing near Japan. In a World War III scenario, a rain of Chinese missiles would devastate Taiwan even if a land invasion fails to occupy the island. Air defense systems would intercept some of these missiles, but not all of them. Taipei, the Taiwanese capital, would almost certainly be reduced to rubble from Chinese air and missile attacks, and other cities would feel the heat as well. Taiwan's major military bases would be destroyed or seriously damaged. Millions of civilians could potentially be impacted, and many billions of dollars in damage would accrue. Meanwhile, other countries would feel the knock-on effects. Since Taiwan is currently the world's most advanced manufacturer of the semiconductors at the heart of the digital economy, the impact to the economic and financial systems of other countries would be harrowing. If we think the global semiconductor shortage is bad now, one need only imagine the impact that the complete destruction of the supply chain coming from Taiwan would have on the global economy. Taiwan would almost certainly be wrecked if World War III were to ever break out, even if China cannot cross the strait. Taiwan is not the only country in the region that would suffer severe damage. Competition in the hotly contested South China Sea has intensified in the past decade, making it one of the world's most dangerous hotspots. Around the middle of the 2010s, China began occupying the South China Sea and building highly militarized artificial islands, with 20 outposts being in the Paracel Islands and 7 in the Spratly Islands. Some of these islands have airstrips and can carry Chinese missiles. These islands have proven dangerous obstacles to freedom of navigation in the South China Sea, but they have also brought China into dispute with its neighbors in the region, most often the Philippines and Vietnam. International courts have rejected China's claim that most of the South China Sea is its territorial waters based on the so-called Nine Dash Line, a map which originated in 1947 that supposedly backed up China's historical claims on the Paracel and Spratly Islands. The controversy has even extended to Hollywood, as Vietnam has banned the popular Barbie movie from its cinemas over a scene supposedly depicting a map featuring China's territorial claims in the area, showing just how sensitive the controversy is in the region. The South China Sea has enormous strategic value, as 21% of global trade, a total of nearly $3.4 trillion, transited the trade routes in the area in 2016. Geopolitically, whichever country controls the shipping lanes there can potentially cut its rivals off from the supplies coming through these waters. In this light, China's expansionist actions in the area can be seen as an act of self-defense, since the country is very dependent on food and energy imports. Conversely, China's tightening grip on the trade routes threatens to cut vital supply chains to Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and other American allies. If World War III were to break out, the countries along the South China Sea may not suffer damage to the extent that the Baltic states, Taiwan, or others we will look at later would, but they would surely be caught in the crossfire, especially if they were to join the coalition led by the United States in an attempt to dislodge China from the waters of their respective exclusive economic zones. China's People's Liberation Army Navy PLAN, would use the South China Sea bases to attack hostile forces in the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, and other countries which would likely join the anti-China coalition. Air raids and missiles would take a heavy toll on these countries, especially their coastlines. Military bases in the interior of those countries would also become targets. They may not be central battlegrounds in the conflict, but all of these South China Sea countries would suffer. But World War III would also take place on a front far further to the north, and one country that would suffer almost complete destruction in a World War III scenario is South Korea. In a full-scale World War III scenario, it is certain that conflict would once again break out on the Korean Peninsula, 
Although the two countries have had disagreements and standoffs in the past, North Korea is still, at the end of the day, a vassal state of China. It is completely dependent on the Chinese economy for its continued existence. Without Chinese support, North Korea would not be able to produce the most basic of goods. Therefore, when push comes to shove, and it would in a prospective World War III, it must do what China says. In World War III, China would want to tie down as many American forces on the Korean Peninsula as possible and prevent them from reinforcing Taiwan and the South China Sea or other fronts that are more important to its strategic goals. North Korea would therefore be used as a cat's paw to help make this happen, and South Korea will be caught in the crossfire as part of China's plans. Aside from its dependency on China, the North Korean regime has always maintained that it is the legitimate ruler over the entire Korean Peninsula. For historical reasons, North Korea would take advantage of the breakout of a global conflict to satisfy this claim. Although South Korea's land border with North Korea at the Demilitarized Zone DMZ, is the most heavily fortified piece of land on Earth, this does not mean it will be able to escape the destruction of a renewed Korean conflict even if North Korea is unsuccessful in its attempt to cross the DMZ. North Korea has thousands of conventional artillery pieces along the DMZ pointed straight at Seoul, the South Korean capital, which is only a few dozen miles away from the border. Some of these North Korean artillery assets would be destroyed in the opening hours of the conflict, but many of them are well hidden, and American and South Korean forces would be unable to destroy enough of them to save Seoul. In a full-on bombardment of Seoul, a RAND Corporation estimate from 2020 suggests that up to 200,000 people in the South Korean capital could die from the North Korean artillery attacks in the first hour alone. Millions more would probably die in the sustained bombardment, even if there are evacuations in place. Seoul's population is about 9.6 million as of 2022. Many of these people would become casualties from the barrage of nearby concentrated artillery. The humanitarian damage would also sap resources from the South Korean government and its allies, which could not be put into the war effort. The financial damage, too, would be catastrophic, not just to the South Korean economy, but to the global economy. South Korea is home to some of the world's most valuable companies like Samsung, LG, and Hyundai. The loss or disruption of these companies would do significant damage to global supply chains and devastate the South Korean economy. As the 20th century came to a close, South Korea was touted as one of the world's foremost economic miracles, emerging from poverty and dictatorship into a wealthy industrial democracy with stunning speed. If war were to ever break out again on the Korean Peninsula though, which it almost certainly would in a general conflict between the United States, China and their respective allies, South Korea would not survive in its present form. Even if the North does not use its nuclear weapons and if it's unable to get past the fortifications of the DMZ. Meanwhile, North Korea would be at least seriously damaged in a renewed Korean conflict as well. Its air force is hopelessly outdated and the United States and its allies would quickly establish air superiority over the war zone, and help from China would not be as high as the North Koreans would desire. As North Korean troops get decimated by the air and firepower of their enemies, it's likely that the regime would resort to nuclear weapons, and if needed, the American, South American, and other Allied forces may hold back from invading the North far past the DMZ for this reason. If any front in a World War III would be the likeliest to see the use of nuclear weapons, it would be the one on the Korean Peninsula. Elsewhere in Asia, Japan would also suffer major damage in a World War III scenario. The country hosts dozens of American military bases, especially on Okinawa, and these bases are easy targets for China's ballistic missile arsenal. In the event of World War III, it is certain that they will be attacked by these missiles. Furthermore, Japan has a territorial dispute with China over the Senkaku Islands in its southern reaches. It is possible that these islands will become battlegrounds in an attempt to tie down Japanese and American resources away from Taiwan and other important fronts. Japan also has a territorial dispute with Russia over the two southernmost Kirill Islands far to the north. Although a Russian invasion of Japan would probably be out of the question, Japan would need to keep a watch on Hokkaido, the northernmost of its main islands. North Korea too has a penchant for testing ballistic missiles over Japanese waters and airspace. North Korea's barrage against American and presumably Japanese bases would add to the damage and prevent supplies and reinforcements from crossing the Sea of Japan to the Korean front. Okinawa would be devastated by missile attacks. The main Japanese island of Honshu would also suffer damage, as there are several American bases there as well. To prevent buildup of troops and supplies in Japan, Chinese and North Korean missile attacks may strike over a much broader range. It's likely that in a full-scale World War III scenario, all of Japan would suffer from conventional missile strikes. 
It is certain that China and North Korea would care little for striking civilian areas in Japan, just as their ally Russia has shown how little it cares in attacking civilian areas in Syria and Ukraine. If a general war were to ever break out in the region, it is likely that catastrophic financial damage and civilian casualties in Japan would result. Tokyo is the world's largest metropolitan area and home to 37.2 million people as of 2022. An attack on Tokyo would make even an attack on Seoul look tame by comparison. Forgetting for a moment the purely military value, the damage to morale, supply chains, and the tie-down of resources in dealing with the carnage would create significant value for China and its allies. Although an actual ground invasion of the Japanese mainland is unlikely on any front, air and missile attacks would devastate the country in World War III. Thus far, we have spoken of countries in the democratic bloc led by the United States as being the ones most likely to suffer terrible damage, but the authoritarian bloc would also suffer. Belarus would likely come into the crossfire. In the initial phase of the conflict, Russia's numerical superiority in the Baltic theater would likely overwhelm Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, even if the initial assaults are costly for the Kremlin. But as NATO reinforcements arrive from the United States and Western Europe, they would try to retake the lost territory along the Baltic. Poland would certainly see some damage. Military bases there would prove easy targets for Russian missile attacks. Russian bases in Belarus, though, would be equally damaged in NATO missile attacks. Belarus would likely become a battleground, as NATO forces coming from Poland look to lance through the Russian lines at the Sawalki Gap. A flanking maneuver through Belarus would be one option to break through the Russian land blockade of the Baltic states. Although such an operation would see heavy fighting only in Belarus's western areas, it would still do devastating damage. Meanwhile, China itself would suffer severely too. Although an actual invasion of mainland China is highly unlikely, Chinese cities like Beijing would suffer badly from ballistic missile attacks. China is not the only country that has such missiles. As in other densely populated urban areas, hundreds of thousands or millions of civilians could lose their lives. The United States and its allies like Japan and Australia would be far more averse to attacking civilian population centers than China and its allies. But a Taiwan under Chinese bombardment would likely not view things the same way. As part of its porcupine strategy, Taiwan is amassing missiles that can penetrate deep into the interior of the Chinese mainland. These missiles would first be used to target military assets, but Taiwan would have little reason to hesitate to use them against areas in major cities as China targets sites in Taipei and elsewhere. China's enormous size and well-defended inland positions means it would not suffer the worst effects in World War III. But it would not be isolated from the conflict especially since the areas around its territory would be some of the biggest hotspots. But what do you think? Which countries would see the heaviest damage in a conventional World War III? Don't forget to let us know in the comments, hit that like button and subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. The rise of powerful artificial intelligence is threatening to put much of the human workforce out of a job. Soldiers and sailors are among those whose jobs may be threatened by the rise of AI. Meet the Sea Hunter the world's biggest drone ship to date, and one whose coming arrival signals that the AI revolution extends far beyond cyberspace or the skies. Drones have been an increasingly important part of warfare for the past decade or more. It is easy to see why politicians and the military brass would have a fondness for them. They are cheap and expendable, making them easy choices for risky missions. However, drones are becoming essential to the conduct of military operations in general and integrating themselves into the heart of a fighting force's ability to wage war effectively. The fighting between Armenia and Azerbaijan in 2020 was perhaps the clearest demonstration that drones had arrived as one of the most important items on the battlefield. In that conflict, the Azerbaijanis used drones to devastating effect against the Armenian army, which had always been blessed with superior soldiers and officers until then. Azerbaijan turned this situation around by using drones to reconnoiter the Armenian lines and reserve placements, direct firepower against ideal targets, and then use the drones to guide ground assets against the Armenian reserves, effectively cutting off the Armenian forces from one another and destroying them in detail. Drones have proven to be as important in the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Both sides have used them in important operations with Russians using Iranian drones on Ukrainian civilian infrastructure. Meanwhile, the Ukrainians have used anti-personnel and anti-armor drones against Russian supply lines, among other targets. The wide-scale, multi-purpose use of drones in the war between Russia and Ukraine 
reveals how central they are becoming in warfare. Up to now, unmanned assets have largely been associated with air power, targeted killings, and surveillance for fighting on the ground. But the Sea Hunter is one of the first signs that this is about to change. Drones are now taking to the seas. In the spring of 2016, the United States Navy christened a new ship. With a price tag of $23 million, the ship was an unmanned surface vehicle USV, called the Sea Hunter, officially known as the Medium Displacement Unmanned Surface Vehicle MDUSV. The Sea Hunter originated as part of DARPA's Anti-Submarine Warfare Continuous Trail Unmanned Vessel ACTUV program. In 2018, Fred Kennedy, then director of DARPA's Tactical Technology Office, described the vessel as part of the US military's plan to trade small numbers of very capable, high-value assets for large numbers of commoditized, simpler platforms that are much more capable in the aggregate. He analogized it to trading smaller numbers of kings and queens on the maritime chessboard for a lot of pawns that were of lower quality, but when taken as a whole, would get the job done more cheaply and effectively than traditional naval assets. In a sign of the concept's initial success, DARPA officially transferred the Sea Hunter to the Office of Naval Research on January 30, 2018. The Sea Hunter measures 132 feet in length. It is a trimaran vessel made up of carbon composite materials. The drone ship is capable of traveling at up to speeds of 27 knots, about 31 miles per hour, powered by its diesel engines that can carry 40 tons of fuel, enough to last for months. The Sea Hunter is designed to have an effective range of 10,000 nautical miles, putting any designated mission area in the world within its reach. It will also be designed to remain operational without any human prompting for at least 70 days. In this way, the Sea Hunter's mission duration is much like a traditional ship or submarine. However, these months-long voyages for manned assets are always expensive. One of the reasons why the Navy is so excited about unmanned ships like the Sea Hunter is because the drones will be able to take some of the same long voyages at a fraction of the cost of doing them the traditional way. The Sea Hunter could do some of the same anti-submarine tactics with 10 or more times less expenditure than doing them the traditional way. The Sea Hunter's primary purpose is to find enemy submarines. To do this, it has sophisticated sonar and radar that can specifically detect diesel-electric submarines, which are quieter than the US Navy's nuclear submarines when they run on electric power. Diesel electric submarines are the type that currently compose the bulk of the underseas fleet for China's People's Liberation Army Navy PLAN, signaling what the US naval brass intends the Sea Hunter's primary mission to be. The Sea Hunter is not yet operational, but if it joins the fleet, it, or whatever succeeds it, will be able to complete its missions without any human input, even from remote control. Its designers have stated that the Sea Hunter is meant to be an autonomous ship so that it can do tasks it needs to do on its own. It operates purely on artificial intelligence, which gets information from its sophisticated radar and electronic systems. In 2016, Scott Littlefield, the project manager for DARPA, said, We didn't want a remote control vessel. We actually wanted something that could behave appropriately and do complicated missions under what we call sparse human control. To ensure that those complicated missions get done, the Sea Hunter boasts a capability to maintain constant communications with other ships and satellite systems. Taken together, these assets are designed to replace the traditional human crew in information gathering and decision making, at least in the immediate term. Sea Hunter vessels are not currently designed to carry weapons. They are essentially the maritime equivalent of surveillance drones. Their mission would be to spot hostile submarines. They would not attack them on their own initiative, however. Once the Sea Hunter spots a suspicious or enemy submarine, the artificial intelligence will then notify more traditional, manned naval assets about the submarine's location. The humans aboard those ships would then make the decision about whether or not they could attack the spotted submarine. This mission will require constant communication between the Sea Hunter and traditional assets via satellite. After identifying a target, the Sea Hunter will move on to other potential targets and predict what they will do next. In addition to tracking submarines, the Sea Hunter has programs in place that would allow its artificial intelligence to track international ships and monitor shipping routes. It can act as a deterrent as well, trailing potentially hostile craft and directing them to comply with the commands that human operators make in that situation. 
This ability would make the Sea Hunter a valuable asset in the US Navy's freedom of navigation operations in the increasingly contested and dangerous waters of the South China Sea. US Navy ships participating in these FONOPs are often trailed by PLAN ships and other assets. The Sea Hunter throws a new obstacle that China would need to deal with. More on that in a moment. However, it is not yet clear when the Sea Hunter will join the US Navy's fleet in a fully operational capacity. The trials are still ongoing. Building an autonomous ship is not yet easy. However, there are some promising developments. The Sea Hunter presents challenges not unlike the companies which are trying to design autonomous road vehicles. Although there are fewer surface obstacles in the ocean, the artificial intelligence steering the Sea Hunter will need to anticipate and respond to dangers on the spot without any human prompting. Thankfully for Lydos Holdings, the defense contractor behind the Sea Hunter, their project has had some promising results. The Sea Hunter has made successful ocean crossings, proving the concept of drone ships. The Sea Hunter's early tests were so satisfactory to the naval brass that some military experts anticipate that when the ship launches, it will not be limited to the primarily anti-submarine role it was initially conceived for. Instead, the Sea Hunter could take on a much broader array of missions, including surveillance, reconnaissance, and intelligence-gathering tasks. A ship of the Sea Hunter's size would also be able to carry weapons, and it seems likely that the Sea Hunter or other drone ships like it will soon bear arms. For the US Navy, the Sea Hunter's arrival is coming at a critical time. The United States has, over the last 10 years, slowly but steadily lost ground in the military balance of power in the Indo-Pacific region. China has used a lot of the money from its breakneck economic growth to build an increasingly modern navy, which has become more and more of a challenge to the US Navy in the waters near the Chinese mainland. China is not only building modern ships and aircraft carriers, but submarines as well. It has also built and militarized artificial islands in the South China Sea. These bases boast scores of ship-killing missiles. Additionally, the PLAN patrols the South China Sea aggressively, claiming that all the waters in the area fall within Chinese territory. In response to the growing power of China's PLAN, and to a lesser extent the Russian Navy, the United States Department of Defense developed its third offset strategy in the mid-2010s. The development of this doctrine signaled that American national security strategy would be shifting away from the war on terror and asymmetrical counterinsurgency campaigns and toward state-based military competition. As the United States looked to maintain its military superiority in the face of more aggressive and capable nation-states like China and Russia, who sought to challenge the US-led international order. The ACTUV program, which includes the Sea Hunter, is part of the Pentagon's approach to the new great power competition. Countering the growing capability of the Anti-Access and Area Denial A2AD systems of competitor states is one of the most integral parts of the third offset strategy. This idea primarily refers to China's huge arsenal of ballistic missiles, which pose terrible danger to American bases and traditional naval assets, like carrier groups in the Indo-Pacific region. A 2019 report from the U.S. Army's Center for Lessons Learned revealed part of the strategy to counter enemy A2AD assets. To offset an adversary's A2AD, the U.S. military must live and operate within the A2AD region. The National Defense Strategy NDS, represents a re-emphasis on forward presence, but a forward presence of a particular kind. It is not about presence for its own sake or for symbolic or reassurance purposes. Rather, it is about combat-credible forward forces, that is, forces that are or can rapidly get forward, survive a withering Chinese or Russian assault, and blunt the adversary's aggression. Both represent geographical challenges equal to none that the US military has encountered. Unmanned ships like the Sea Hunter are consistent with this strategy. For example, the Sea Hunter and other ships like it will increase the US Navy's capability of defying the PLAN's attempt to choke the South China Sea's waters because they will not suffer fatigue and are easily expendable. This is what Kennedy meant when he talked about overwhelming the chessboard with pawns that, on aggregate, can do the same job as, or a better job than, the higher quality pieces. In a military confrontation, many of these unmanned ships would be destroyed by enemy missiles. But because there are no human casualties on board, their loss is far more easily sustainable, and the ships themselves can be easily replaced because they are much less expensive to construct. In contrast, a traditional naval asset like an aircraft carrier falling prey to a cheap Chinese missile would involve the loss of thousands of lives and tens of billions of dollars. Meanwhile, as the Chinese missile stockpile gets depleted in taking out the cheap drones like the Sea Hunter, 
Other, more expensive assets can be brought more confidently forward and blunt the adversary's continued aggression. In a less dramatic and far likelier scenario, the Sea Hunter is also ideal for Grey Zone operations. Grey Zone operations are defined as a kind of hybrid warfare that skirt the line between peaceful activities and hostile ones. For example, China's use of an aggressive fishing fleet in the disputed waters of the South China Sea skirts the line between peaceful commerce and hostile force projection. These are not armed military vessels but have nonetheless sought to monopolize resources and prevent other ships from exploiting international waters or the waters that fall within the exclusive economic zones of other nations in the area, such as Vietnam and the Philippines. Similarly, China's constant air patrols that come within Taiwan's Air Defense Identification Zone ADIS, steadily exhausts the latter's resources and saps its morale while avoiding a direct military confrontation that could be costly for the Chinese military. Cheap Sea Hunter-type drone ships can counter these grey zone operations by being easy to produce in big numbers and not falling prey to traditional fatigue or attrition items. From there, they can be sent out in large numbers to patrol the areas that countries like China want to shut off from other nations. China's shipping fleet, for example, would have a much tougher time of it if their ships constantly needed to contend with unmanned drones from other nations harassing them in the same way that they currently harass international shipping. In a world increasingly defined by the grey zone operations of authoritarian regimes like China and Russia, which are still reluctant to directly challenge the United States' traditional military superiority, drone ships will fit right in. It all sounds great if the Sea Hunter can be made operational in the near future, but can it? As of August 2023, the Sea Hunter has not yet joined the US Navy fleet. The Sea Hunter's successful ocean crossing was a major milestone. On January 31, 2019, only a year after DARPA transferred the ship to the Navy, Lidos announced the Sea Hunter had made the voyage from San Diego to Pearl Harbor and back, less than three years after the ship was first commissioned. However, beneath this glittering announcement, it was revealed that the Sea Hunter had a manned ship monitoring it throughout the journey. Sailors also boarded the drone at times to ensure that its electronic and propulsion systems were functioning properly. But progress has been steady. In August 2022, the Sea Hunter participated in that year's Rim of Pacific exercise, a multinational effort involving 26 participants. At RIMPAC 2022, the Sea Hunter joined forces with a manned destroyer to demonstrate how traditional and drone ships might cooperate. It was one of the most eagerly anticipated parts of that year's RIMPAC event. It was also important experience, since sailors are often busy with their own tasks and do not have time to do the manned-unmanned work. The RIMPAC exercise gave them opportunity to do something they would not ordinarily do. The results at RIMPAC were apparently promising, with the Seahawk and Destroyer team satisfactorily integrating their anti-submarine capabilities together, doing all of the tasks the exercise's planners wanted to do. Throughout the exercise, the Sea Hunter was fully unmanned except for when it came in and out of port. Progress on the Sea Hunter seems to be proceeding satisfactorily then, although there is still no announced date for it to join the US Navy fleet beyond the current trial runs. The pressure may be building on the US Navy's brass to deliver though, because the United States is not the only country that is interested in creating drone ships. As China continues its naval buildup, it is determined not to fall behind in the drone race. It too is experimenting with unmanned surface vehicles and the PLAN is building one that some observers call a direct knockoff of the Sea Hunter. A photo spreading round on Chinese social media in the fall of 2020 revealed a ship that looked remarkably like the US Navy's unmanned vessel. It too was a trimaran ship, and it had similar dimensions to the Sea Hunter, being about 151 feet long by 50 feet wide. Archival satellite imagery revealed that the Chinese ship was launched before August 30, 2019, and is being built by Zhang Tongfang New Shipbuilding Company Limited in Zhuajing City, Zhangji. We do not know if this is an official Chinese government program or if it is a private effort. However, given the ties that China's corporate apparatus has with the ruling Communist Party and the doctrine of military civil fusion, where the government seeks to ensure that advances in science and technology in the civilian sector can also advance the fighting potential of China's military, it may be a distinction without a difference. China's paramount leader Xi Jinping personally oversees the military civil fusion strategy. So if the Sea Hunter knockoff is technically a private venture, it is almost certainly not independent of China's military ambitions. Although China is known for its rob, replicate and replace approach to Western military and industrial technology, the US Naval Institute USNI 
noted that the Chinese C-100 knockoff is unusual in the degree it copies the American aircraft, even by Chinese standards. The PLAN is experimenting with other drone ships as well, such as the Changxing-1, which it revealed in 2017. Unlike the Sea Hunter and China's copy of it, this craft is likely armed with a 12.7mm machine gun. There is also the Jari Catamaran, which can carry a 30mm cannon, anti-submarine torpedoes and surface-to-air missiles, according to USNI. The Sea Hunter knockoff is much bigger than these other unmanned craft, and while it could carry weapons, the inference that USNI makes is that it is designed primarily to be a surveillance asset like its American counterpart. China's investment in drone ship technology is strategic. Even without weapons, these ships will increase its grey zone operational capabilities, and although the Sea Hunter, and presumably its knockoff, is less capable of acting against faster nuclear submarines that can dive deeper, flooding the zone with large numbers of cheap, mass-produced drones will enhance the PLAN's anti-submarine warfare capability, something which is currently still one of its glaring vulnerabilities. As the retired American General Jack Keane, currently the chairman of the Institute for the Study of War, often says, quantity is a quality all on its own. The arrival of drone ships from both the United States and China will make that quote even clearer. Additionally, the Chinese knockoff of the Sea Hunter will be much more capable of counteracting the subsurface vessels of America's allies in the Indo-Pacific region. For example, Japan, India and Australia, the United States partners in the Quad, do not have nuclear submarines. Like China, they too run on diesel-electric-based submarines, making them ideal targets for China's new drone ship. The Sea Hunter is only one of the first drone ships. The US Navy is currently experimenting with several other types, including the Sea Shadow, Sea Fighter, Sea Jet, and Sea Slice. In the coming decades, we should expect even bigger ones, carrying more sophisticated systems and weapons, to take their place alongside traditional ships and probably replace some of them. Will the US Navy sailor be yet another job that artificial intelligence threatens to replace? What do you think? Let us know your thoughts about the Sea Hunter and the future of drones in naval warfare. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more military analysis from military experts. It's 2023 and we are witnessing the tense tug of war of current global affairs, where the shadow of the Ukraine conflict casts a familiar chill. Ever heard of the Russo-Japanese War? Well, our military experts are here to talk about it today and here's why. This is not your typical history lesson. This is a tale of audacity, ambition, and unexpected outcomes. Picture this, it's the early 20th century. Conflict between two great powers is about to break out in the Pacific, following a surprise attack by Japan on one of its enemy's most important naval bases. The coming war will have vast consequences, changing the course of world history and balance of power in Asia in ways few could imagine. But this isn't 1941, it's 1904. The naval base Japan is attacking doesn't belong to the United States but to the Russian Empire, and the war about to be fought will not end in Japan's unconditional surrender, but in its rise to the status of a modern military power. Often overlooked today, this is the story of one of the most important conflicts of the 20th century, the Russo-Japanese War. Today, let's dive into this fascinating period of military history. Like many other conflicts of its day, the Russo-Japanese War had its roots in the colonial expansionism of European empires. By the early 17th century, the Russian Empire had grown to immense proportions, even securing its hold over the frozen reaches of Siberia. But the empire's attempt to expand southward into East Asia were repeatedly blocked by China well into the 18th century. In an effort to secure more warm water seaports during his rule from 1825 to 1855, Russian Emperor Nicholas I began a policy of expansion. And after Russia's defeat in the Crimean War of 1853-56, this process mainly took place in the empire's Far East. Russia's Pacific expansion continued for several decades. As China's power declined due to European colonialism and events like the Taiping Rebellion, it was eventually forced to cede large chunks of territory to Russia. For the next 30 years, Russia consolidated its borders in the Pacific region, founding the crucial port of Vladivostok in 1860. But after the ascension of Emperor Nicholas II in 1894, putting it in direct competition with Asia's most prominent rising power, Japan. Japan's transformation from a backwater feudal state into a modern industrialized empire began in 1868. That year marked the end of the Tokugawa shogunate, 
and the restoration of the Meiji Emperor to power after nearly 500 years of isolated military rule. During the Meiji era, Japan began an incredibly rapid process of political, economic, military, and social change, resulting in both modernization and westernization. Observers were astonished at the pace of this transformation, such as journalist George Rittner, who noted that in less than 20 years, Japan has acquired the knowledge it has taken us centuries to learn. As Meiji Japan grew in power, it began to present a challenge to other regional powers, including Russia. During the Sino-Japanese War of 1894-95, Russia provided military support to the Chinese Qing dynasty, putting the two countries in direct competition. Despite this, Japan triumphed over Imperial China, leaving it as the strongest power in East Asia by the turn of the 20th century. This competition intensified as Tsar Nicholas set his sights on the Liaodong Peninsula, located in present-day China. The Russian Empire already leased a port on the Liaodong Peninsula from China, then named Port Arthur, but it wanted to have a base of naval operations totally under its control. Given the Russian Empire's history of military expansionism, the Japanese initially tried for a deal, offering to cede control of Manchuria in northeastern China. Under the terms of the proposal, Japan would have maintained influence over Korea and headed off Russian ambitions. But this was not to be. Russia refused Japan's offer and demanded that Korea north of the 39th parallel serve as a neutral zone. Thus, when negotiations broke down in 1904, Japan opted to go to war, a scenario it had long been preparing for. By that year, the country's armed forces had grown to around 400,000 men, and it boasted the fourth largest navy in the world while a staggering 82% of the national budget was devoted to military spending. The new military was highly professional, modeled off the Prussian general staff and prioritizing education and tactical leadership over inherited position. It also managed to replace the long-standing clan loyalties in Japanese society with emerging nationalism, inspiring an almost fanatical loyalty summed up in the reminder to soldiers that duty is heavier than a mountain, while death is lighter than a feather. The Imperial Japanese Navy both modeled itself off the British Royal Navy and managed to acquire top-of-the-line British-built capital ships, which it would soon put to good use. Together, these factors made the Japanese military one of the most battle-ready forces in the world. The contrast with Russia couldn't have been more stark. Following centuries of expansion, by the start of the 20th century, the Russian Empire had entered a period of stagnation. Despite being more than one million strong, most of its vast army was in Europe, while only 150,000 were actually stationed in the Far East. The vast majority of these were undertrained, poorly equipped, and severely lacking in organized leadership. Its officer corps was mainly composed of aristocrats who received their positions due to favoritism, not ability. The Russian Imperial Navy was in a similar state by 1904. Most sailors come from landlocked areas and had almost no real experience at sea, while many officers did not even know the names of those serving under them. And while Russia had seven battleships and 11 cruisers near Port Arthur and Vladivostok, they were far older than Japan's fleet and also in poor repair. So when negotiations failed, Japan was in a far better position than most assumed. While the initial attack would come from the Navy, the idea was to score decisive early victories both on land and at sea in order to achieve a peace agreement with highly favorable terms. Because Russian financial resources and manpower were still far greater than those of Japan, the Japanese wanted a short, decisive conflict, which would force Russia to abandon Korea and the Liaodong Peninsula. Japanese officials planned a dual operation, where one group of soldiers would land in Korea and force their way north into Manchuria, while another landed at Port Arthur and moved up to defend the southwestern flank. The two groups would then join together and stage a combined offensive to push Russian troops back to the city of Harbin. Ideally, the United States or Britain would then intervene and broker a peace treaty favorable to Japan. To pull off this audacious strategy, Japan chose to lead with a devastating surprise attack on the Russian Navy around Port Arthur. This was inconceivable to the Russian leadership, who believed that their numerical advantage and supposed racial superiority would doom any Japanese attack. So the Port Arthur attack came as a shock to Nicholas, who had been told by his advisors that the Japanese would not challenge Russia militarily, even after negotiations between the two powers had collapsed. So on February 8, 1904, when Japan officially declared war on Russia and sailed its combined fleet into Port Arthur, things went pretty much how you'd expect. 
Russia had only light defenses outside the harbor, with most ships unprepared for combat and troops ashore. Japanese Admiral Togo Hayachiro was still worried about the possibility of Russian artillery taking out Japanese ships, so the attack was carried out under the cover of darkness. Capital ships waited outside of the gun's range, while ten destroyers armed with torpedoes crept towards the unsuspecting Russian fleet. At 11.30 pm, the first four launched their attack, severely damaging three of the largest vessels, the Tesarevich, Retvizan, and Palada. Russia was able to open fire at the second group of Japanese destroyers, forcing them to retreat. The battle for Port Arthur began in earnest the next day, while the rest of Russia's Far East fleet remained largely protected within the harbor of Port Arthur. Japanese initial attacks stopped the cautious Russian commanders from taking the battle to the open seas. So even though attempts to establish a Japanese blockade of the port failed, the move was a potent psychological victory. And even the Russian ships that evaded the Japanese did not escape entirely unscathed. On April 12, 1904, the battleships Petropavlovsk and Pobeda were able to leave Port Arthur, but struck mines just after making it out to sea. Petropavlovsk sank while Pobeda chugged back to port heavily damaged. While Russia responded to that attack with mines of its own, severely damaging two Japanese battleships, the Japanese fleet retained the upper hand at Port Arthur, continuing to bombard the harbor with heavy shelling and containing a true Russian counterattack. Another theater of the war soon opened on land. Without waiting for a major victory at sea, the Japanese had begun in March transporting their first army, under the command of General Temamoto Kuroki, across the sea to Korea, landing it at Incheon, not far from Seoul, and at Nampo in the north. Many days later, the Japanese army moved into position on the town of Uju, on the Yalu River. On May 1st, the Japanese attacked, and after brutal fighting, defeated the Russians by storming across the river. Japanese losses were about 1,100 men out of a force of 40,000, while Russian losses were 2,500 out of a force of 7,000 defending troops. The Battle of the Yalu River was incredibly significant. Although the outnumbered Russians made an orderly withdrawal and did not suffer overwhelming losses, it was Japan's first successful battlefield victory against a Western country. The next major turning point was the Battle of Liaoyang, where after nine days of stubborn fighting, the Japanese won a significant victory in spite of inferior numbers, 130,000 against 180,000 Russians. Russian troops under the command of General Kuropatkin retreated to the city of Mukden. Two major battles of the Shaho River and Sendepu proved to be indecisive. Despite the Russians receiving nearly 30,000 men per month in reinforcements, the Russian garrison at Mukden would remain there for several months before attempting another offensive. At sea, Russia fared far worse. By the end of 1904, the Japanese Navy had sunk every ship in Russia's Pacific fleet and had gained control of its garrison on a hill overlooking the harbor at Port Arthur. However, the Japanese found the Russian garrison there much stronger than they had expected. The Russian defenders had highly fortified their position with breastworks and barbed wire, and had several well-placed machine guns. After making several very costly attempts to take the fortress, the Japanese abandoned general assaults and resorted to siege tactics. Observers from the armies of Western Europe and the United States were embedded with both the Japanese and the Russians, and the effect of machine gun fire on massed infantry assaults was reportedly horrifying. However, the lessons of Port Arthur would be essentially ignored by European commanders, who would replicate the same human wave tactics on the Western Front during World War I. But despite the huge casualties, Japan continued its relentless siege of the port. Then, in early January 1905, Russian Major General Anatoly Stessel, commander of the Port Arthur garrison, decided to surrender, surprising both the Japanese and Russian leadership in Moscow. Stessel, believing that the harbor was no longer worth defending in the face of humiliating losses and trying to save his men, that meant Japan had achieved another hugely significant victory in the war. Perhaps unsurprisingly for Russia, Stessel was later convicted of treason and sentenced to death for his decision, though he would ultimately be pardoned. After the freezing winter of 1904 forced a temporary slowdown in the fighting, things resumed in the spring of 1905. This set the stage for the last and greatest land battle of the war, the Battle for Mukden. From February 19th to March 10th, 1905, Kuropatkin decided to attack, but was cut off by the Japanese advance. This left three Russian armies facing the Japanese, together comprising a massive force of 330,000 men 
and 1,475 guns. This force faced off against three Japanese armies under the command of Marshal Iwayo Oyama, who had some 270,000 men and 1,062 guns. The following struggle was the largest battle of the modern era fought prior to World War I, and potentially the largest single battle in world history up to that point. The resources expended also marked the beginning of modern warfare as we know it. In 10 days, the Japanese side alone fired 20.11 million rifle and machine gun rounds and almost 300,000 artillery shells, roughly the same amount of ammunition as the Prussian army used across the entire 191-day Franco-Prussian War. Losses in the Battle of Mukden were also exceptionally heavy, with approximately 89,000 Russian and 71,000 Japanese casualties. The battle left both sides essentially unable to continue the land campaign. Kuropatkin retreated his forces to the north, allowing Japan to take over the mostly ruined city of Mukden. The Japanese forces were in similarly poor shape despite their victory, and it would fall to the country's navy to win the final, decisive victory of the war, the Battle of Shishima. The Russian leadership in St. Petersburg had decided to send their larger Baltic fleet to East Asia, under the command of Admiral Zinovy Petrovich Rozhestvensky, assuming that once the Russians had gained control of the sea, the Japanese campaign would collapse. The Baltic fleet spent the entire summer of 1904 preparing to sail, and it set out from Latvia on October 15, 1904. Mid-voyage at Nossi Bay near Madagascar, Rozhestvensky learned of the surrender of Port Arthur and proposed returning to Russia. However, since naval reinforcements were already on their way from the Baltic via Suez in early March 1905, he made the very foolish choice to proceed toward Japan. Rozhestvensky linked up with his reinforcements off the coast of modern Vietnam, and his full fleet seemed to be a powerful armada. In reality, however, many of the Russian ships were old and unserviceable, especially compared to Japan's modern fleet. So early in May 1905, the fleet reached the China Sea, and Rozhestvensky headed towards Vladivostok, via the Shishima Strait. Japanese Admiral Togo lay in wait for him off the southern coast of Korea near Busan. On May 27, as the Russian fleet approached, Togo attacked. The Japanese ships were far superior in speed and firepower to the outdated Russian vessels. In the course of the two-day battle, over two-thirds of the Russian fleet was sunk. Six ships were captured, four reached Vladivostok, and six fled and took refuge in neutral ports. It was an overwhelming defeat for Imperial Russia. After voyaging seven months and getting within a few hundred miles of its destination, the Baltic fleet was totally shattered, and with it, Russia's imperial dreams in the Far East. Shishima is also an often overlooked watershed moment in 20th century military history. The battle was the only decisive engagement ever fought between modern steel battleship fleets, and the first in which radio communications played an important role allowing for improved coordination between Japanese vessels and commanders. The battle was described by British military official Sir George Clark as by far the greatest and most important naval event since Trafalgar. For Russia, the disastrous conflict had seriously aggravated unrest inside the country, and the surrender of Port Arthur, followed by the loss of Mukden and the devastating defeat at Shishima, made the emperor accept an offer of mediation by the US President Theodore Roosevelt. Negotiations were held in the state of Maine from August to September. In the resulting Treaty of Portsmouth, Japan gained control of the Liaodong Peninsula and Port Arthur, the South Manchurian Railway leading to the port, as well as half of Sakhalin Island. Russia agreed to evacuate southern Manchuria, which was restored to Chinese control, and Japan's colonial control of Korea was recognized. Roosevelt would be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his role in ending the conflict. The war would have far-reaching geopolitical consequences. The costly and humiliating Russian defeat left the Russian Empire demoralized and added to Russians' growing anger at the failed policies of Tsar Nicholas II. It would help the rising popular anger that ultimately resulted in the overthrow of the government during the Russian Revolution of 1917 and the eventual establishment of the Soviet Union. The war also began to shift the global balance of power marking the first time in modern history that an Asian nation had defeated a European empire in combat. It was the beginning of a long period of intensified warfare involving global powers in the Pacific region. Similarly, in her book The Guns of August, American historian Barbara Tuckman argued that because Russia's loss destabilized the balance of power in Europe, it emboldened the Central Powers and contributed to their decision to pursue war in 1914. The outcome of the war also increased Western alarm over Japan, sparking the racist yellow peril myths. 
It also damaged the notion of white supremacy that was widespread in most Western countries. The victory also established Japan as the greatest naval power outside of Europe, which, as military historian Jeffrey Reagan has argued, created a legend that was to haunt Japan's leaders for 40 years. A British admiral once said it takes three years to build a ship, but 300 years to build a tradition. Japan thought that the victory had completed this task in a matter of a few years. It had all been too easy. Looking at Togo's victory over one of the world's greatest powers convinced some Japanese military men that with more ships and bigger and better ones, similar victories could be won throughout the Pacific. Perhaps no power could resist the Japanese Navy, not even Britain and the United States. In fact, the future Japanese Admiral Yamamoto Isoroku, who would go on to plan the attack on Pearl Harbor and command the Imperial Japanese Navy during much of World War II, served as a junior officer aboard the armored cruiser Nishin during the battle which may have given him inspiration for his own surprise attack 37 years later. In the end, the most important lessons of the Russo-Japanese War may be those not learned. Despite the carnage inflicted by modern weaponry on both sides, European powers did not change their battlefield tactics, setting the stage for the horror of both world wars. Similarly, Japan's increasing aggression after its victory showed a failure to learn from Russia's expansionist mistakes. While Russian failure was so complete, that it would result in one of history's most consequential revolutions. Yet, despite its enormous importance, earning it the nickname World War Zero, the Russo-Japanese War is largely forgotten today, overshadowed by the terrible conflicts which followed it. But what do you think? Just how much did this short conflict shape our modern world? And what might things have looked like if the outcome were different? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis.